Okay, so today we are going to talk about um, like three main topics. Okay, um, one of them is uh, probability trees. And we're going to see now why it's like an alternative to Monte Carlo, okay, what we have done yesterday. And we're going to see when do is it's very useful to use it. Then we're going to talk about the field development process, okay, that we skipped that discussion on the first day. But now we are going to see exactly what is done in every stage, what kind of engineering tasks. Just that should have been given the first day, but you know, I like I change swap a bit the topics just to start with the technical part first. And then the last point that we are going to discuss today is offshore structures for hydrocarbon production. Okay. There are many other structures, like uh, for to make drilling, like to lay pipes, but uh, we are going to talk only those that are for producing hydrocarbons, okay, where you're going to have the hub for all your facilities, and what kind of structure do we find, and how do we select them, okay? Yes, so let's talk about probability trees. Okay, and probability trees, they are used, they were used for many, many years in the industry when we didn't have this computing power like um, like what we did with Monte Carlo, okay? They didn't have Excel, they didn't have very advanced tools, so it was a, it's a, it's a traditional approach, approach that requires less computing power. Okay, so it was an advantage in that time and there and and that's why it was very much used. The next thing is when we have discrete variables, okay, when we have discrete variables. Okay, remembering the example we have done yesterday, you had all of these properties, right? permeability, uh, porosity, we had volume of the rock, we had saturation, okay? These are continuous variables. We can say they change continuously from a minimum to a maximum. When we have a discrete variable, it can say something that I have one option, three options, okay? Some discrete variables are, for example, the vessel type, okay? Okay, the ship type, if I have three ships that I want to choose from, that's discrete, that I cannot make it continuous. Also, if you have a decision variable. Okay, something that I can decide if to choose this way or that way. And, and many other things, Some, sometimes, um, yeah, some sequence, sequence, um, I can also use it like with a tree. So there are some things that simply Monte Carlo um, uh, is not well suited for it, especially discrete variables. Okay, so we are going to talk about. Um, so I suggest we do it with an example right away, okay? Just to see how the technique works. Um, and that, so I gave you on a memory stick, I gave you, uh, you see the amount of exercise we have made, almost one, two per day, which is uh, nice, I think. Um, so if you open, in the memory stick you have these two exercises, the eight and nine, okay? And you have the Hebron, the PDO of the Hebron field that I suggest you go through it and read what kind of things does it involve, okay? A lot of other things we haven't covered. We just covered some, a few things that I think are very important. 
and uh, I also share with you um, so the video and the note for from yesterday, but also a file that okay, we are going to use later. Okay, about this person, this professor Larry King Klingenberg. Okay. And we're going to use that later, okay? Yeah, by the, by the end of the class. But just to tell you what kind of things I, you, you got on the memory stick, okay? But for now, let's open this Word file, okay? And the, the, the name is, your company is deciding whether to develop a reservoir or not in the Rovuma region, okay? To help them take the decision, you have proposed to use a probability tree. Okay? And then it says it's very early, so you don't have any production profiles, you don't have any um, any uh, reservoir model, you don't have any tubing model, nothing. So you're going to use this expression simply to calculate the monetary value. And each company, they have their own simplified expression. Okay. Something that they just simply put how much I can recover, the total recoverable reserves or the NPU, and the capex, how much it's going to cost to, to develop the field, and they combine it somehow, okay, with a factor combine it somehow. That's a simplified equation that you know I use to calculate the value of the project, how much it represents in money. Okay? And what it's saying here is that what is the mean expected value of the development? Is it worth to look further into developing this field or not? Okay, and you're going to use a probability tree. So you see here we have mainly two variables, okay, from which we have, and then we have a choose a choosing to say to develop the reservoir or not. Okay, so that's a decision, a discrete variable that I have, and then I have two variables, TRR and CAPEX. So already you have to think that your tree is going to have three levels, okay? We are going to show very, very soon how, okay? So it says use three values of TRR in the decision tree, okay? And also here at the end, it tells you three values for the cost, okay, for the CAPEX. So let's see how that looks like, okay? So we have to say first the text, the first step, is to is to identify how many variables the decision tree or the probability tree probability tree has okay in our case we say we have the decision variable develop or not, okay, where we have only two, okay, is the decision if I develop or not. Then the second one is the TRR, okay, where they told me I have to use three values, okay, and then I have the CAPEX where I have um, also three values. Okay, so let's draw the probability tree, how it will look like. So you usually put the first one, which is the decision, okay, you usually, you put it, if you decide not to develop, right, simply you don't have to make that calculation, okay, you don't have to make this equation. Okay, you simply decide not to develop. Okay? But if you decide to develop, then you have to make that calculation. So the first node okay, is going to be a decision node. And the decision node, we are going to use decision. Decision node, we do it with a square. Okay? Now, chance node, that I have no control. Okay, I can get any of the options, and each option has a probability, but there is a chance, okay, I can get one or the other, like in the TRR, what you saw yesterday, okay, on our on our problem that we were solving, this Monte Carlo, okay, 
there is a probability okay I don't have I have some probability I will get this number but I can also very well get something down here okay there is a probability so probability nodes chance nodes are simply a circle I make it with a circle and I have n node which I make with some sort of a triangle okay so these are the type of nodes I have on a tree so we start with a decision node simply okay and that decision node has simply two to develop okay do I develop the field okay and I have simply yes and I have simply no okay if no then simply okay end of the line I decide no what is the value of that option okay the monetary value what I express here uh, what was here before okay monetary value I have no TRR and I have no expenses but simply the monetary value is equal to zero US dollars okay I don't do anything now if I decide to develop the field okay I have three options right the first level you see you have two levels okay TRR it can be that and that's a chance node okay for the TRR okay it can be that I get one TRR okay or I get another TRR another number and we are going to see now how to find these numbers and TRR okay here in principle I could I should have a continuous variable right because I can get really from any of these numbers okay but in a tree like I said before we cannot use continuous variables we have to discretize okay so I have to have three options and each one of them has to have some probability okay like for example this number has 80 percent this one has 20 and this one has 10 okay but I discretize so these numbers let me make a comment here I have to discretize requires discretizing the continuous uh, distribution okay after that I have the TRR okay I can get the chance that I get the reservoir this size the reservoir this size or reservoir this size okay and after that what do I have what else do I need to calculate monetary value the capex right but in capex each one of them also I have a chance okay so this is the capex node and I can have capex 1 or I can have capex 2 or I can have capex 3 okay. because it's a chance it's very uncertain okay remember I told you uh, cost so cost figures cost values that means OPEX that means CAPEX that means DRILEX okay usually display uh, um, simply a Gaussian okay or a normal distribution okay just like like a TRR okay they display something like that okay they have a more that's the number we were using in class before but they have one distribution where the standard deviation of that distribution that's for example capex the standard deviation is plus minus the the mean some percentage of the mean okay so you still have a distribution but it's a tree a tree I have to use the discrete values not the distribution so I again make three values that's where it finish okay I don't have any more variables to calculate okay each one of these capex has its probability which can be different from the probability of the TRR okay and then I have here a mean value okay that I can calculate mean value and mean value okay. 
and I ran out of space, but we should do the same for every TRR. For every TR, I'm going to have the same chance to have a high capex, a low capex, and a small, a high capex, a medium capex, and a small capex. So let me try to make it a bit nicer. Here you have capex, one, two, three. Okay. That's the end node, capex two, capex three. And then I have the last option, okay, that's P2. Okay, and then I have the last option, which I have TRR two, TRR three, and then I have Capex one, Capex two, and Capex three. And each one of them will have some probability associated, and after that, I can calculate the mean value of each option. Mean value, mean value, and mean value. Okay? So you see, the tree has three levels, okay? I have one level, it's a decision variable, discrete, yes or no, very simple. Then I have another one, which is a chance. I can get a reservoir of this size, reservoir of this size, or reservoir of this size, okay? And after that, for each one of these branches, I can have a high cost, a medium cost, or a low cost. A high cost, medium cost, low cost. Okay, so I have three levels in my tree. Okay, so let me maybe take, a, okay, just to make, okay, let me take, um, Okay, looks something here, it looks nicer. Okay, I managed to make it nicer. So let's use that figure. Okay. <clears throat> now each option, right, I can calculate because I have for each option, here I made it <coughs> the opposite, okay, but it should be the same. Each option, has a mean value, right? A mean value that I can calculate because each, each option has some capex and some TRR, okay? And I can use the equation to calculate the mean value on all of them. Okay, now the way I make the decision is that I have to assign a number of monetary value for all of this branch. Okay, why? Because I want to know if that number, the average of the population, will be positive, then it's attractive to invest, or it will be negative, and then it's not attractive to invest. But I have to find a number that represents all of this, uh, all of this distribution. Okay, now you don't have only NV for that option. You also have the probability of occurrence of that option, okay? Remember I told you here you have P1, P2, P3, and that P is related to capex, in this case, to C and to C. And here you have P1, P2, P3, but this probability is related to uh, reserves, okay? So let's put R on top. So the probability of each of each option is this probability multiplied times this probability. Okay? So you have P1 of capex times P1 of uh, uh, the reserves. Okay? Then you have P1 of capex times P2 of reserves 
and P1 of CAPEX times P3 of reserves. And here is the same, okay? Here you have P2 of CAPEX times P1 of reserve, P2 of CAPEX times P2 of reserve, P2 of CAPEX times P3 of reserve, and the last one is P3 of CAPEX, P1 of the reserve, P3 of CAPEX, P2 of reserve, P3 of CAPEX, P3 of reserve. Okay, so I can calculate a probability for each option, okay? That will be the multiplication of both. Okay, let's say here that you have a very high cost, okay? But the, the probability for that cost is very low. It's only 10%, okay? So this number probably will give me negative Okay, but due to this point one, which has a very low probability of occurrence, then you're going to get a very low number. So it's right, you can have a negative number in the project, okay, but it has a very low probability associated. Okay, here it might be the opposite. You have a very high capex or a very low capex, but has a very high probability of occurrence. Okay, so the way the way I calculate the expected value of the branch, okay, the way I assign a number, okay, of this branch, a monetary value, we call it the expected, sometimes it's the expected value of the branch, but in this case we're going to call it the expected value, monetary value, expected EMB, okay, is that I multiply the value times that probability. Okay, and then at the end, I sum all of them up, okay, and that is the expected MV. Okay, it's like I wait, I make a sum, but it's a weighted sum, okay. I know not all of them have the same probability of occurrence, okay, therefore I weight them with the probability, I sum them up, and then I find a number. It's like similar in a, in a way to what we have done with NPV. Okay? We cannot sum the numbers that are different years because they're going to be discounted. Here, we cannot sum the numbers because they have different probabilities. Okay, So that's why we wait with the probability and then we find that number. And if that number for the branch is negative, means you know I shouldn't go for it because in average, they, you can get a negative number. But if it's positive, it means you know, I should, I should maybe go for it. Okay? So that's one thing. Now comes the other question, okay? So how, how to discretize, okay, how, where do we get from, how do we get the discretized values? How do we get the discretized, discretized, values of, okay, TRR or CAPEX, you can have any other variable here, but how do you have, do you calculate it if you have a continuous function, okay, from a continuous function? Okay. So for TRR, people like to people like to use the numbers we showed before. Okay, for TRR, people like to use simply okay already a defined number P10, P50, and P90. Okay, they like to use those three. I represent my whole distribution with P10, best case, P50, medium case, P90, the worst case, okay? So let's go back to our distribution that we had. And the distribution looks something like that, okay? Where I have here TRR, uh, here TRR max, 
and I have here 1 and 0. Okay? So I locate first the first step, 0 0.8, 7, 5, let's say 0.1 is here. Okay, I locate first all these points. Yeah, so maybe, yeah. And I locate all of these points first on the curve. Okay. Now I have to find an associate probability for each one of these points. Okay, what is the probability that I'm going to get these reserves, that reserve. So you remember when we were doing this frequency analysis, right? We had some numbers, 1, 5, 10. And we had to define that everything that was 7.5, between 7.5 and 12.5, everything will belong to 20, yeah, to, to 10, okay? You remember that? We have done it yesterday. So here we're going to try to do something similar. The way we do it, okay, the way we do it, first we take a horizontal line in one. Okay, then we take a vertical line through the points, okay? through these points that I want. Okay, then <clears throat> the next step, I'm going to make it, and here we have to be very careful. You see that now, here I got an area, right, that looks like that. Yes? Okay, so now I have to locate I have to locate, um, wait, wait a sec, let me show, just be sure that I'm making it correct. Yeah, this is from the top. Okay. So I have to define a number here, okay, such that the area that I have below is exactly equal to the area that I have above, okay? And that number, I move that horizontal line up and down until these two areas are the same. They should be the same. After that, I have defined my, this one, okay? You simply the distance. This will be the probability associated with, uh, probability associated with P10, P90, sorry. Okay. The point where my two areas are the same, and now I read the distance, and that's the probability associated with P90. Okay, now, you see here, now it formed this, now this new area. Okay, what do I do now? I go and try to find a horizontal line such that that area becomes the same. Okay, this area becomes the same as that area. And here they don't look too much the same. Okay, and the last one, which is already fixed, this area here, my drawing doesn't help, okay, but this area should be the same as that area. <laughs> but, you know, my drawing doesn't doesn't help much. Okay. So that's how I find, and the distance between these two, and the distance between these two, that will give me a probability, and that will be P50 and P10. Okay. But that's how I discretize, just trying to make sure that the that the areas are the same. Okay? The areas above the point and the areas below the point. 
when I make exactly them the same, that will be that length will be my uh, my probability. So that's what is described. I usually in the in the exam. I think that was. Uh, for last year, okay, I make a small, I gave a small text ex describing that process. Okay, you try to find this number such that these two are the same, this number such that these two are the same, and that these two are the same. Okay, here they're doing it with cost. Okay, so here explains the whole process. Draw a vertical line at A. Okay, so let's make that exercise. I think you have um, let's see what I gave you. Uh, so let's open the word, okay? So you have you have to discretize the curve, okay, that you have here. You have to discretize in three values, P10, P15, P90. Then you have to find the probabilities to use on the tree. But the capex, I have already done it for you. So you don't have to make it. You have here the number, and here you have um, the probability. Okay, so let's discretize this function. You can maybe do it. Okay, so what is the first step? The first step is to locate the points, right, that I'm going to use. So I'm going to use, they already told me, they want to use P90, which will be this guy here. Okay. They want to use P50, that is this guy here, and they want to use P10. The next step, I make a vertical line, okay, on those Okay, on those points. The second step, okay, I try to find a vertical position such that this area is equal to that area. So I think here we have to put it a bit higher. Okay, I think so. Okay, maybe here. Okay, so for, let's say for P90, what is the probability that I have? Let's say it's maybe 81, okay? So it's 0 0.21, okay? That's the probability of P90. You can do it more precise in your, in your, if you print it, you use a ruler, then it's going to be much more precise. Now we go to the second, okay? The second, we make again a vertical line through here, okay? And we have to make sure that this area, okay, is the same as another area here. It, that this area, okay? So where should I put my line? Maybe here. Okay, so I'm going to put it here, and that means that P50, what is the probability of P50? It is from 81, okay, sorry, 79, okay, 79 minus 20. How much is that? 
59 so it's 0 0.59 okay that is that distance here okay and the last one we end up that this area we don't have to do much but this area is equal to this area okay therefore this one will have p10 will have a probability of 0 0.2 okay so now I have made and your curve oops. I hope the projector didn't get uh, damaged It's starting, so. Okay, but that's the process to find the numbers. Okay, if you already give the numbers by default, that's the process to find the probability. Okay? Okay, so to summarize, I managed here to convert into a discrete distribution, okay, and what are the numbers? So, TRR and the probability, I'm representing all of this complicated distribution by three numbers, okay? The first number is P90. P90 is how much? 128, half of it here is... Um, 15, so this should be, yeah, let's say 128 million barrels, okay? Just to, to make it simple. And the probability is 0.21, okay? P50 is how much? 173 e to the 6, and the probability is 0 0.59, okay? And P10, okay, which is, um, yeah, let's say 233, e to the 6, and the probability is 0.2. So now we have found, in our tree that we draw before, here, we have found each one of these numbers with each one of the probabilities, okay, from a continuous um from a continuous distribution. Okay, so now we have everything we need to solve our problem. For that, we're going to use Excel. Okay, um, Excel, and I suggest we use this tree. Okay, not the one that I draw here. It should give you the same result, but uh, let's use this one because that's the one I made originally. So first, the first level is with TRR and the second level is with cost, okay? So for that, you have the Excel sheet that is called decision tree. Okay, so I think we have to do something. Let's move these two down. Okay, then let's, let's move these two to the left. And then let's move these two up. Okay, 
such that we have first the first level is TRR and then the second level is CAPEX. Okay, and I'm going to put it side to side such that we can say exactly So I just moved these two, you know, that was here, I moved them here. Okay, and I can do it by selecting this area, pulling it down, and then pulling this one to the, to the, to the left. Okay, so I'm going to call the options. This is the first option, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so I'm going to put nine options. One, two, all the way to nine. Okay, I have to evaluate only nine. These trees, they can become huge, okay, depending on the variables that you are using. But here is very small. It's a very small tree. Only nine options. TRR, okay, for the first option, I have the same TRR basic, basically, okay, P90. Okay, so I'm going to copy here and I have to repeat it. For one, two, and three, I have the same TRR. Okay, what is P90? P90 is 128 e to the six. Okay, and I copy and it will be the same for all of them. And the probability of that TRR, how much was it? 0.21. Now let's go on that branch and let's look at the capex, okay? It's not here where we said we we're going to use this one. I have three capex different, each one with their own probability. Okay, so we I think we have to go back to the Excel sheet to see what these capex are. Where is the Excel sheet here? Um, not here, but let's see here. Okay, the capex I have one 0 0.7 billion. 0 0.7 billion. Then the second one is 1.1 billion. And then the last one is 1.5 billion. Okay, and the probability of each one, one of them is 0.3, one of them is 0.4, and one of them is 0.3.
Okay, so to summarize, we are, we said we are on the first branch, okay? So all of them have the same total recoverable reserve number, which is P90, okay? Then we take the probability of that P90 and put it here. And that we have gotten from from discretizing, right? We have gotten from discretizing for making this process where the areas are the same. We have gotten those numbers. And then we go back to the branch, okay? And that branch has three values of capex. Capex one, two, and three. That luckily, I don't have to discretize. They were given before by a colleague, okay? 0.7 billions, 70 millions, no, 700 millions, uh, 1.1 billion, and 1.5 billion, each one of them with their own probability. Now the next step is to calculate the mean value, okay, or the value of the, of the, the, the monetary value, okay? And here I use the formula, I don't think we have BBA, so simply CRR times 60 times 0 0.4 minus the capex. I don't block anything. I want to drag it down and it should, it should change, okay? TRR times 0 0.60 times 0 0.4 minus capex. And then I drag it down. And you see the change is quite significant between one option and the other. You know, 2.4 billion, 1.97 billion, or 1.57 billion, what I have to expend. Okay, what is the next step? We go to the next branch, right? What was the next branch? TRR2 with P2, how much is TRR2? 173, okay, e to the 6, 173, e to the 6. And that will be the same for these four options, okay, because we are now looking at this branch, okay? So this branch, all of these capex, they have the same. The probability of that 173.59. Okay. Now, the capex, okay, we're going to go for the cost of that branch. It's going to be exactly the same as for this branch that we already did before, right? Exactly the same numbers. So we can just copy these six cells and paste them here below because they are exactly the same, the same number. Okay. 
the monetary value okay so for that we have simply to drag these three okay and you see now we have even bigger variation the NPV or the value has you know 3.5 billion 2.65 billion but so far all the numbers are positive so it's looking very good for the economy okay is looking very most of the cases here on these two branches they are all of them are positive okay now we go the last one what is the last TRR 233 233 e to the 6 million barrels and then here I have 0.2 then I drag it down the capex is exactly the same, so I copy again these six cells here, and then I calculate a monetary value like that. Even bigger because that branch is for higher reserves, okay? So it's higher amount of oil. This goes, this is small reserve, medium reserve, and big reserve, okay? Therefore, every time the value is getting bigger and bigger. You don't get the same? Hmm? Okay, now Okay, now we have a few numbers, right? But we know each number doesn't have <clears throat> the same probability, okay, of occurrence. They are different, okay? So to calculate <coughs> the probability, we are going to, here you see, is the multiplication of the capex times the TRR. Okay, so I'm going to say this cell will be this probability times this probability. So that means that that option that I get a 2.4 billion on that project has a 6% probability of occurrence. 
okay? Then I drag it down, 8%, 6%, there is one that has 17%, that has 24, that has the highest, okay? So here you obtain some sort of like a distribution, okay, for your for your MV. I just here have multiplied uh, column C times column E. Okay. But to take a decision, remember what was the purpose of the tree is to get the value of this branch, okay, of the whole branch, to characterize a branch by one value. So I have to multiply each value times that probability, okay, and then sum of them up. So let's do that to see what is the average value or the mean value of the expected value of the branch. Probability times the value hmm? yeah. no they have the same exactly is the same equation mm -hmm. okay this is the weighted p times mb and then the expected monetary value will be the sum of all of these options. Okay, 3.1 billion. This is just the sum of that column. So if I make my tree once more, Okay, we had this tree where this level was TRR and this level here was CAPEX. Okay, so we are saying that all of this branch has a monetary value EMV of zero of uh, 3.11 billion. Okay. What is your conclusion? What do you recommend the company to do? Go for it, okay? Has value, has a positive value. So you say, go for it. Let's go and develop this field. It makes a lot of sense. Okay? Okay, so the conclusion of our calculation is, or the answer, if you get this problem in the exam, the answer is going to be, go for it. So the answer, yes to develop, yes to development. Okay, so you see, trees are very useful, especially when I have, when computing, when I need 
big computing power. Okay, remember, Monte Carlo, I need to make many number of iterations. If that model takes a lot of time to run, I can use probability tree. So that is another case where I use probability tree. When uh, simulations take a long time, okay, when um, or when I have discrete variables, something that I want to choose from. Probability trees are very often used in appraisal, okay? Is used often in appraisal, okay? When you want to decide if to drill an appraisal well or not, you say, what is the value I'm going to get from this well? Try to compute that. And based on that, you make the decision. Okay? The, the steps are, you define the number of variables you have. Okay? Here we have three. The decision to develop or not, that should be the top one. Okay? Then we have the TRR. We are going to use three values. And the CAPEX. We're going to use three. And we create our three it doesn't matter if you use first the CAPEX and then TRR or the opposite. It should give you the same result, okay? Then we said each option, if I fix CAPEX and I fix TRR, I get a monetary value, but I also have a probability associated with that option, which comes by multiplying the two probabilities of the two branches, okay? If I sum all of them up, the product of the value times its probability, I'm going to get the expected monetary value of that branch. And that's the number I have to use to say if to develop or not. Now, how do we get these discretized numbers? Well, we have a trick. It's very much made graphically. You can also do it in Excel or numerically, but it's more you know, it's more time consuming. So we simply try to define a horizontal line where these two areas are the same. Okay? The same thing here and the same thing here. And when we do that, we're going to get the length of this segment will be the probability. Here was 0.1, here was 0.59, and here was 0.2. Okay, that means that there is a higher probability that my numbers will be closer to P50. Okay, you see 0.6. The other two are 0.2 only. So I have higher, much higher, twice higher, no, three, three times higher, that I will have total recoverable reserves close to P50. Okay, and then we made that, that exercise. So let's now go to, to another thing, okay, to another topic. And here we don't have exercise, so it's good to be, I, it's just me telling you stories, okay? Which is the field development process. Okay, some things that we didn't get to discuss. Okay, and for that, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I think that will be more effective. And it's away. Okay. So we know already we have we have that that scheme, okay? We have if you see here the violet part at the bottom that gives you like the main stages. I think I have to Yeah, I'm not sure what's happening with the recording. Thank you. 
break, so. Okay, so that's the process. We have identification of business case where we're making pre-exploration, exploration and appraisal. At some point we find a discovery, okay? Then we, we, dis, we find a reservoir, we, dis, we make a discovery. After that we reach decision gate, DG stands for decision gate zero, okay? And we have to do some things there. Then comes the planning of the project, where we have three stages. We are going to see roughly what is done in every stage, okay? But that process ends up in the issuing the PDO, the Plan for Development and Operations, okay? That you saw already how it looks like, the amount of work that it has. Then comes another phase called project execution, okay, where you are going through all the details, making the manufactured drawings, making the construction, testing and startup. Finally, you have one more decision gate, and that's only you decide to abandon, only something major happen, okay? No, doesn't happen very, very often, but if something major happen, you can take the decision of simply stop. Then operations, abandonment and decommissioning. So let's try to go one by one, okay? The first one. What is the main purpose of this stage, okay? It's just to prove, you have to prove inside the company the economic potential of the discovery and then quantify and reduce the uncertainty in the reserve size, okay? How much do I have, okay? Just to make sure that it's economic enough. So. You have a few phases, pre-exploration, also referred to as scouting, where you start to collect information on areas of interest, okay? But you have to take many considerations into account. It's not only that, you know, the volumes, how the geology looks like, if it's very likely that you will have oil and gas. But you also have to take into account sometimes politics, okay, if you like to be in that country or not, because Maybe the two countries don't, the one where your company is, the one where you are going, they, are, they don't get along very well. Uh, geological, if that particular area that you have, it has the, all the conditions to, to have oil and gas. What are the conditions that we need to have oil and gas? We have to have accumulation of this organic material, right? Then we need to have that they, they are not, you know, they didn't, uh, uh, they didn't um, de degradate, okay? There was not enough ox oxygen for them to degrade. Then that you have sedimentation on top, okay, for a long, long time, 150 years, million years ago. Then that you have a, a, a source rock where that material was cooking for a long period of time, high pressure and high temperature. And that material migrated to a rock that will be the reservoir rock, and that you have a seal. So these are all the conditions. You had sedimentation of organic material, you had a source where you were cooking and that you produced that oil and gas, that you had migration and that found a reservoir rock that is suitable, and that you have a seal that captured that. Too many conditions, okay, to have oil and oil and gas. Geographical, where is it? Some companies don't work outside some region, don't like some regions. Uh, social, environmental, if you go to the Arctic areas, maybe it's very sensitive, so some companies say we don't want to do anything with that, okay? So that's political regime, government stability is very important, technical challenges. Tanzania Block 2 is a very challenging, okay, because of this up steep. It's very deep, 
and it's like an up steep uh, uphill uh, uh, taxation regime okay sometimes some countries are more attractive with taxation than others like in Norway the taxation is very high some other places is less personal security if you're going to have a field there if it's going to be safe for your workers they are not going to have any attack by any terrorist group or by any militia in the country environmental sensitivity we mentioned earlier and this is very important also if the company has had previous experience in the region if you have to come new to the region and you have to establish everything from scratch it's going to be a big effort if, if you already have some experience either from some partner from something that can be you know a plus to develop your field after you do all of that homework then you have to get a what is called a pre-expiration license okay and that is that is non-exclusive non that means that many people can say I want to look at this place they tell the government they apply for some for the license <laughs> and then they get the right to explore but they cannot drill wells okay they can do things that are non-invasive uh, but you have, can have many others looking in the same place okay so typically in Norway and it's like that in other parts of the world only seismic and shallow wells are allowed you're not allowed to drill to make uh, a well to see if you have oil and gas okay and this is not done by oil companies typically but it's not done by other companies that they sell data to oil companies okay you identify some prospects with these two you say well i already know which area i want to look at i already know which part of the world okay that's what i was saying before seismic how is it done offshore emit the, the source of the wave it reflects with the different things you have below and then you can make a map how it looks like you're not sure that you will have here oil and gas okay but you see some structures that they are very good for storing oil okay, and gas. Then the next step is that you apply and obtain an exclusive production license. This gives you the right to drill inside, to go there and drill and see, verify what do you actually have. They typically subdivide the area in squares okay, of certain size. So you have to pay the, I think in Norway we have two licensing rounds per year they open they say you can apply the companies come and they apply I want to apply for block this is <clears throat> six thousand and three hundred and three six thousand three hundred and three different blocks but they have to pay a fee okay and the fee per year are you know that's um, how much is that that's like uh, four thousand dollars per square kilometer okay and you can have a lot of kilometers here okay square kilometers and it's going to go increasing that means if you do nothing with that license you're just keeping it to yourself it's going to cost you a lot of money over time you see how it increased for the first year is four thousand second year is eight thousand for the third year is you know twice sixteen thousand okay so it's increasing dramatically year to year and that is done by the government to avoid that you know they just sit with that place without doing anything um, yeah in Norway it's called APA it's called awards in predefined areas I think here in Tanzania you have to pay for that license I think it's five million dollars I think they have a fixed price after that you start to perform exploration if you already found that you have some area that is very attractive you make all kind of studies to try to refine it you maybe make seismic more you know more with more resolution you make uh, seismic geophysical surveys geological studies you make exploration drilling that's very important and here you do all of those things we discussed before you make cores okay remember we take a sample of the formation take it up 
wall cores we try to scrap from the wall that's slightly quicker cuttings what are cuttings is what comes out the debris that i'm okay when the drilling bit is cutting it's some cuttings they they are coming out okay and these cuttings how are they carried to the surface with the mud okay the mud I hope this is recording. I'm not sure. Okay, I have my hole. Okay, and I have my drilling bit that is cutting. Okay, and I'm injecting mud inside and it's coming out. Okay, and then it's flowing up. Okay, that's the drilling mud. Okay. What are the functions of the drilling mud? Okay, one of them is carry the cuttings to surface. Okay, the other one is to cool the bit such that you don't get high temperature and it gets damaged. The next one is to lubricate. Okay, you want to have good lubrication where you're cutting. What else? is to avoid if I by any chance I have a pocket here that I'm drilling and it has oil or gas I don't want it to go inside the wellbore because then I will have a blowout so the other function is to pressure control of reservoir fluids what else I think not, nothing else, right? I think. Okay. Um, you have to uh, make cutting samples, uh, fluid samples. You want to see what you have there. Waterline logs that allows you to see where is your reservoir rock and what, where are the contacts. And productivity tests. Here I have an example. It's from Halliburton that is called drill stem test, okay? That is done during, during exploration. Okay, so you have, okay, you lower the pressure, that's the mod, okay, that you have. And you start feeling it, so you start sucking from the formation. And you go and store it, in some containers. Here you have three containers. Okay, so that's just to test without sampling anything. Here comes the reservoir fluid. Okay, you're taking only a little bit, but then you make a sample. Okay, you take a container with that sample and you can take here up to three. Okay, this test is called real stem test. Yeah, and you can have all kind of other things, other configuration to increase the area. You measure the productivity of the well, all kind of things. Okay, you see here comes the mud first and then starts to come the oil. Okay. So that's just to say how productive the well is going to be, what kind of fluid do I have, and with the core you get porosity, you get uh, permeability, you get all the, all the properties, net to gross. Then you make a discovery. Discovery means you found an accumulation of oil and gas that is big enough to be economic, that you think is economic, you suspect will be economic. Then the next step is the assessment of the discovery and the uncertainty it has, these numbers. And that's what they mean by risk management. Okay, you have to say, I have something, but I have to know the risk. Okay, what, are, what is the upper and the lower bound? Okay, so that's what we have done here in class, probabilistic reserve estimation. Okay, identify and assess additional segments. 
if you have maybe one big pocket, but it might be you have some others, perform a simplified economic valuation of the resources. That's what we have done today, okay? We didn't do a full NPV, but just somehow combining the expense and the, uh, the cost, the expense and the revenue, and then you have to do some more appraisal usually. It's not only enough that you find a well, you have a lot of oil, you are happy, okay? You have to find how big it is. So you have to make appraisal. And appraisal basically means if you, this is the top view of a reservoir, okay? Top view. Okay, if you drill only in one place, and you found oil, you're happy, you want to know exactly what is the extension of the reservoir. So you start drilling on the outer part to try to see how big it is. And also, if you see on the lateral side, okay, it might be that the reservoir is not exactly uniform. If you see from the side, you want to drill and find out what is the structure. Okay, so that's what we mean by appraisal. Okay? More exploration and seismic to determine fault communication. If you have two pockets, you want to see if they are separate or if they are the same. Because what happens if they are the same? You can produce it with one well, right? But if they don't communicate, you put a well here, you won't be able to produce that pocket. Okay? So it's very important to define the number of, of, of wells. Reservoir extent. Aquifer behavior, if it's a very strong aquifer, very big volume that is going to support your reservoir, or if it's very weak. Location of the water oil contact, which is very important, and the gas oil contact. Okay, finally, after that phase, DG0, you have to, there you have to do something, okay? And this something, these are these five options. You have to issue a SOC, or it's called statement of commerciality. You have to say, this, I have found economic amounts of oil and gas, and I want to develop it. And you have to tell that to the government and to, any, to everyone. Okay? Either you can say, well, we have found something, but we don't know yet the size. It can be very small. So we have to do more appraisal. Okay? Then you can say, I found something, but I don't want to develop it. I'm going to sell it to someone else. I'm a small company, I found something very big, I'm going to sell it to someone else, and you make a lot of money. Do nothing, you just wait, okay? That's what Equinor was doing in block two. They have found, they have a discovery, but they say, well, let's wait for maybe we get a better condition in the future, let's wait that the LNG market will be more mature, they are waiting for some strategic reason. Or you say, I found something, but it's not big enough, so I just give it back to the government. Someone else will take care of it. Okay, those are all the options for DG0. Now, DG1, which is called the project planning, we have to perform feasibility studies. With that discovery we made, the objective is to justify further development of the project. And that's what we were discussing before. You have to find one, at least one, but it should be more than one, concepts that are technically, commercially, and organizationally feasible. At least one that works, but usually we evaluate many of them, okay? Then that's yeah the objectives of the development in line with the corporate strategy. If you have a long plan in the in the country or if you have a long plan, then you want to use the existing infrastructure. You want to use uh, maybe some neighboring fields. You will think that that will make you stronger in that particular market. If it's a new area, you just want to produce and get the hell out of it. You're going to have a different way to 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 do things, okay? That's that part, feasible development scenarios. And this is very important, create a project timeline. When do you think you're going to start producing and what is the work plan you have to do to make that happen, okay? You have to make a lot of studies, so you have to make a plan. When am I going to perform all of these studies, okay? 
very important technology gaps and blockers okay like for example if you say I need a floating LNG is that technology something that is available or not okay if it's not available that's a problem okay because for some reason I wanted to develop my field with LNG needs for new technology added value opportunities that typically for example I say well the gas I just re-inject I don't sell okay but maybe if I sell the gas to someone that needs it that's going to increase the value of my project okay so that's an opportunity that can create value for my project and one more thing is that cost evaluation for all development options okay and the numbers are very uncertain plus minus 40 percent typically okay but you have to make evaluation if you propose five different ways to develop the field you have to give a number for all of them okay then comes the concept planning dg1 to dg2 and here you have basically to narrow down to one concept the outcome of dg2 is to say this is the best case the base case scenario okay so you have to identify you have to rank them and you have to select and and have a viable concept okay so you have to each concept you have to develop more you have to put more data inside you have to calculate what is the production profile you have to calculate cost okay and basically you then you have to compare those alternatives okay and take out those options that are non viable it might be some options that because they are too costly simply they will never fly okay or simply because they require some technology that is not ready yet okay so you discard those options okay like in the case of Hebron I think we have seen yesterday At one, and that's something that is typically done in this phase. Okay, here. Okay, you have different development concepts, and you have to make some sort of a ranking. Okay, so here they but they decided to use some criteria economic technical environmental and with that they take the decision of of you know which option to use uh, now they have to do a PEP which is called a project execution plan that describes the, the project and the management system Okay. And then you have to define all the commercial aspects, okay? Legislation, under which laws you have to abide, okay? The agreements, licensing, financing, who is going to pay for that? Do I need to raise money in the stock market or in the with my in private capital? Can I finance myself, but my company? Um, supply, taxes, I have to, and many of these things I have to solve with the government. Okay. okay, here you create for the first time a static and a dynamic model of the reservoir. So you want to see how the structure of the reservoir looks like, how is it spread, what is the thickness, what is the extent, how many units you have. But then you have to define a dynamic. That means you have to start to populate with things that you can calculate how much you're going to get from that reservoir okay and then after that that what we have done okay the first day and the second day define the depletion and production strategy um, it's going to be mode A plateau mode B simply decline uh, I'm going to produce this field first and this reservoir later uh, sometimes I have two reservoirs and one of them has for example uh, a non-attractive characteristic for example it has high h2s okay h2s is something that is very difficult to treat so you want to produce little from that reservoir more from that one such that 
the combination will have an acceptable level of H2S. Okay? So there are many things that play into account here. Define HSC program, okay? Uh, human safety environmental. Here, that also we have done here in class, the flow assurance evaluation, okay? Identify challenges related with fluid properties, multi-phase handling, and driving pressure, pressure okay? Flow assurance, we have many issues, like I, uh, like I mentioned earlier. You have hydrate, you have wax, you have corrosion, you have erosion, you have emulsion, you have formation of bacteria. So you have to make all of those evaluations and, and then, you know, find a strategy to, to cope with that. Planning of the drilling and the wells. We already have know how our structure of our reservoir looks like. So we say, well, it's better to put one well here, another here. We already know where the wells have to be. So we have to define from where to drill it, drill them. Pre-design of facilities with that production strategy, we get the production profile. So we know how much uh, oil and gas we have to process. So we know how big the separators have to be, the compressors, the pumps. Uh, planning of operations, startup and maintenance, okay? cost and manpower estimates of the best viable concept. Okay, so we again we do cost, and in this case the cost figures they are uh, plus minus 20 percent typically, because you have already contact the providers and they have already given you a more uh, accurate number. We still have a few to go, okay? But pre-engineering, okay? Here you already selected one concept, unique concept, that's the best, okay? And now you have to mature it and define all the details inside that concept, okay? Selection of the final technical solution, okay? And then you execute the feed studies, front-end engineering uh, and design. Okay, that is a, no, is a name or an acronym you have to remember, front-end engineering and design. And you have to say, what are the technical requirements for each part? For the separator, I need a separator for this pressure, for these fluids, with this length, with this size, with this type of control. For the pipelines, I need a pipeline of this size, this type of insulation. For the wells, I need this Christmas tree, this manifold, these valves, etc. You do it for that because after you're going to ask someone to make it for you. Okay, so you have to design exactly what do you want. Okay, it's not that you can go to a shop and you say, Give me a Christmas tree, and you get it. They have to make it for you and they have to know exactly what size, what conditions, what characteristics, everything. Okay, estimate cost. Plan and prepare the execution phase. And finally, remember, the output of that is the PDO. You have to submit the PDO to the government. Okay? For that, you have to deliver usually the following. Plan for development and operations is that document. Usually, you have another document that is plan for installation and operation of facilities for transport and utilization of petroleum. If you have a pipeline, if you are sending with tankers, if you are sending with pipeline, you have to use also that report. And the environmental and social assessment report. I think I have one. Let me see here. I think it's for maybe Edward Grip. This one, maybe this one. Okay, consequence evaluation of. That's the second report. You see it's relatively short. 
but you have to say here what or what kind of consequences okay introduction here you say health environment and security and safety uh, then you say okay where is it located okay how some some definition of the field okay how it's going to look like so that's not the main point of the report, but the main point is how it's going to affect the emission of CO2 emissions. If there is a spill of oil, where is it going to go? How is it going to affect the coast? Okay. Here we have something saying how are the currents going? So if there is a problem here, where is the oil going to go? Okay. How is it going to affect the fishing? Okay, so here close to the area you have fishing areas. Um, yeah, you see you have here that's different types of fish. Where are they located? And your field, how is that going to affect them? Uh, the, these are the birds, okay? What kind of birds and how can it affect the birds? The marine biology. These are other, uh, that's I think plankton. Okay. Uh, let's see what else do we have fishing fishing is a big issue in Norway so you have to make sure you don't affect fishing okay traffic of boats in the area how is that going to affect you see here how many boats are circulating and they try to make a map how that's going to affect the region okay environment to the to the to the air and those are co2 uh, when we are drilling, we have all of these cuttings we have to dispose, and they have to make sure that these are disposed in a good way. All kind of things. These are the CO2 emissions. You see, try to predict how much emissions you're going to have. Okay? So initially, you have a lot of emissions due to drilling, but then you have the main emissions are due to processing and operations. Okay? Okay, that's uh, how you're going to treat the, the, this uh, drilling mud. What are you going to do with the cuttings? Okay, the cuttings I'm going to throw here and they want to see how is that going to spread the little amount of, of substances it has. So how is that going to spread? All kind of things. And then I think there is one saying those talking about social consequences for okay so that's what happens if there is a spill okay how is that going to affect the cause how what is it what kind of the cause is going to affect okay pollution Again, fishing. I see. I think they have some social things. Um, okay, that that's it. In this case, no social consequences. And we submit to the government at that part, and then the next step is just to wait. You wait for the government to give you an answer. Okay, and the government can say yes, or it can just tell you. No, you have to revise or you have to change this. We don't like this part. There is too much risk or we don't like the way you're developing the field. You're leaving too much oil and gas behind. So they can tell you basically to go back and do a different concept. Okay. And that's very costly. Then finally, we go into the section of execution of the project. Okay. Where we have detailed engineering. We have to refine all the details. We have to start building. We have to send, get bids from the bidding process. You say, I want to build a ship, a separator, a pump, pipeline with these characteristics. Okay. Detailed design, procurement, construction, and, and I can do it in two ways. Okay. Uh, that's also something you have to remember. You can, the company can issue individual contracts, one for pipeline, one for separator, one for the ship, 
one for the whales, one for that. But then they have to have a lot of resources inside to follow up all of these activities, okay? So that means detailed engineering, bidding, contract, construction, fabrication, installation, and commissioning. You start all the things. Or you can work with an EPECM, okay? Which is an engineering, procurement, construction, and management contract. The company says to start to coordinate all of these things is simply just too complicated. I don't have the resources inside. So they contract one main company, okay? Either Technip, FMC, someone, and say, you take care of this. And they give a full contract and they have to find out how to do it, okay? With a DPCM. Okay? A big part of that is to start to drilling the wells, completing them, prepare the handover to operations. You have to explain what do you have, how do you use these things, and preparing for startup, operation, and maintenance. Finally, operation phase. Operation, you already know, you have startup, build up phase, plateau phase, the decline phase the tail production, the last part, and finally the shutdown of the field. We have to do maintenance. Sometimes we found that um, there are some more oil than we expected, okay? So we have to make what is called IOR, improved oil recovery methods. Maybe you decide to drill more wells. Maybe you decide to inject something to improve recovery. Maybe you decide to use a pump, artificial lift to help the lifting. You have to, allocation is very important, how much is coming from where to define how to pay back the revenue, metering, de-bottlenecking, okay, with time. Okay, that's just a short comment on de-bottlenecking. Okay, with time, remember we are not only producing, that's with time, we are not only producing simply oil, okay, but we are also producing water, okay, and water is typically increasing with time, that's Q water. And um, we have, so that, no, that's not Q water, that's water cut, okay, and the GOR. Okay, the gas oil ratio typically is constant, but then it does something like that. Okay, therefore, you're going to have to deal with the Q water and Q oil. Sometimes they are too high, therefore they, they create a bottleneck. Okay, they take space in the separator that should be space for the oil. Okay, so in that case, you have to reduce the amount of, of oil. Okay, finally, the last step that I mentioned before that is sometimes overlooked, okay, is the abandonment and decommissioning. And you have to do engineering down and clean. That means flushing and cleaning, take all the hydrocarbons out of the tanks, the processing equipment, and the piping, okay? You have to start making a plan with the environmental and governmental authorities to see that you're going to stop production, you're going to get rid of these uh, chemicals. You have to do the wells, you have to do well plugging and abandonment, okay? You have to make sure that you leave the wells the way they were originally, okay? That you create a barrier such that, you know, not... Uh, uh, there are some regulations for that. Um, you have to pull out the tubing, plug and abandonment. You have to pull out the tubing. Okay, you have to take this one out. And then you have to put two plugs. Typically, there are two plugs that you put here. Okay, two plugs of cement with some separation. And you have to make sure that they are going to hold. Okay, that they are going to hold with time. 
Another thing you have to make is you have to, uh, the well conductor and casing, the upper part usually is 15 feet that you take out such that, okay, you remember we had at the top, we had the surface and we have the, here we have the Christmas tree, okay? So they want you to be at least 15 feet, most places, 15 feet below the seabed that you have to, to remove. Um, remove topside equipment, you have to scrap everything you have on top. Removal of the offshore structure, and this is very big, okay, you have to let me see, I have a, I think I have a video. Okay, this one. Okay, so this is a beach ship, let's see if you have, okay, that's the platform we want to bring up. That's the beach ship. And you will see, uh, so it's getting, between in the legs, okay, it's getting, and that's very impressive, it's pretty impressive. It has it in the middle. And the next step is to, they start to lift it. the legs and you put it in a special bag you see like that uh, like okay to lift and you transport it to the truck and then at the end you end up just with this let me see if I have a video of uh Employee. They have okay, taken off shore experience with the yard. It's construction okay, and industrial the companies in Scandinavia. With the they have taken off shore as a world leading actor in the offshore decommissioning industry it, with the state of the art facilities and with regards to. Okay, that's when they do it on. With an excellent safety uh, record manner, they have taken offshore okay. 5,000 tons of top side structures, mostly steel but also other materials, and some fact for several platforms is such equipment, projects instance, such as the yeah, deep structures. Yard, you see here. <laughs> the specially And then they start to break all the parts. Special or other material reducing health and safety incidents okay, and environmental metal, risks. It should be rubber, it should be press record, maybe use it. The water is pumped from the cavern if to the advanced water purification plants. They have this collection tunnel to the plant consists of various big, big consumption of by DNV, taking relevant samples. Recovery of materials, scrap steel, recycling equipment. There are some things that you can still use, some other fields, like the turbines, the separators, some of them, you know, they can use even more and they can be cheaper. And disposal or residues. There is will be some oil and gas, and some oil left in that structure, so you have to dispose of that. Okay. That's, I'm going to paste those here, okay, in this uh, after sheet uh, four. So you have it and you can go through it if you, if you need. Uh, what about if we take a break? Yes, 15 minutes, we come back uh, 11, 11, five. 11, five. Thank you.
Okay, we are going to talk now about uh, about we have been talking well we haven't talked too much about offshore structure, okay? Because all of the examples we have done so far in class, like uh, the block two example, was assuming you have just a pipe and that will go to shore. But in reality, most cases, most fields. I guess many of the fields you're going to get in Tanzania in the future, they're going to be with offshore structures, okay? So there are a few things we have to discuss there, but so what does the offshore structure contain, okay? Or what are the, the components, components of an offshore structure? Okay. So first, sometimes, that's not always, that's optional, okay, typically, but you have to have facilities to make drilling and to make well intervention. Intervention means that you have the capability to enter into the well and retrieving the tubing, okay? That includes the drilling tower, okay? You know, to pull out all of that tubing, okay, we have, let's say we have a platform, okay, we are going to see now the tires in a while, but we have a platform, and you have a well that is on the platform, okay, the well head is here on the platform. If you want to pull out all the tubing that that has, you have to have what is called a tower, okay, a drilling tower. Okay, it's like a, a tower inside the platform where you can actually pull out the tubing in segments, okay? Usually there are joints of three pipes, it's like 30 meters or more, okay? So you can pull out that pipe from the inside and then disconnect, put it on the side. But you have to have that, so you have to have a crane also that has enough lifting capacity for lifting the pipe from inside the, the well, okay? So that's, and the way it looks like, I have a figure here, is like that, okay? You can identify it very, very easily. Okay, this thing here is a drilling, drilling tower. Okay, this guy here is a drilling tower. Okay, and you see it's covered, we don't see actually all the metal because because of the environment, okay? 
if you have it here in the offshore Africa, you will see it doesn't have too much protection. But in Norway, it's cold, so you have to protect the structure from wind. You have to protect it from from weather, all kind of things. Okay. So you sometimes have the drilling tower, and that means that you have to have all the equipment to make drilling an intervention. That means you have to have BOPs. Okay. What is what does BOP stands for? Blowout preventer. Okay which is a control unit we put such that uh, we don't get, when we are drilling, if we start to get some hydrocarbon on the mud, we are able to close, okay, very quickly and safely. We have to have a drilling floor. Drilling floor is where, you know, all the operations happen with all the... Uh, we have to have a mud package. We have to have the mud pumps. Yeah, um, let me see if I have a drawing how the mud package looks like. Yeah, not here, but I think I had it. I think I had a nice figure someplace here. Not here, um, so maybe I should find just mud. Well, it's a system where I have, let me make you make a drawing because I cannot find it. So. Okay, after the mud returns from the well, okay, I have here my drilling bit. Okay, remember the mud is circulating outside. Inside go down, outside goes up, okay. Then the mud comes to the top. That goes to a component called shale shakers. which there are some trays that are moving forward and backwards, very, very uh, agitating. And the main purpose of that is to remove the coatings out of the mud. Okay, they are shaking like that, keeping the coatings at the top and then, then dripping down. So they have one thing where you collect the coatings and then that goes to a mud tank okay, where you have Typically, you have an agitator in the center, okay? And after that goes to a pump, okay? And then the pump goes back to, maybe I can put it the other way so that we don't have any crossing of lines, okay? Goes inside. But this equipment, the tanks, they are huge, okay? What we are circulating is a big amount of mud. And also the shakers, they have to be, they are also big. And I hope I have it, but I'm maybe not. Uh, shale shakers. Yeah, I don't think that's... Okay, that's maybe a picture. Let's see what does it have. Select to for that. Let's take a picture. Okay, maybe that will be better than the one that I made. <coughs> Okay, so it comes out the mud from the outside, goes to this shell shaker. From here you get the cuttings out, 
then you have all kind of other things, okay, to take out the small particles of sand, okay, centrifuge, blah, blah, blah. And then you have, you enter into these, mud, these pits, okay, that they are the tanks. And then you have a mud pump, and then again goes back into the pipe, okay? Very simple. But this is a system, the main point here, this is a system that takes a lot of space, okay? Because the shakers are huge, the pits are huge, and the mud pump is also big. So that requires a lot of space. You need cementing pumps. You have a similar system, but you don't have the shakers, but you have you have to inject cement inside the well, okay? So you have to be also have another pump, you have to have another storage tank for the cement. You have to store the drill pipe, okay? If you're drilling, you're going to have, remember, it's three kilometers, okay, down, that you have to reach. So you have to have these three kilometers of pipe stored on the deck, okay? They're going to be laying someplace here on the deck. Let me maybe show you a, a figure of that. Uh, that would be March. Developer. The right hands. While tripping with the main okay, system, so casing for the next step of the operation the can be made up and racked down. back in the low setback the area by the crew working with the auxiliary. Tripping. Dr it is a okay, safe and efficient system, controlled and monitored pipe. by... Let me see if I have... Okay, this is a very advanced rig. With one fiber on system. Oh. Let me check if I have... An equipment situation. Tree says tracted equipment. There is a better figure. HROV. New ultra deep water develop... Thus, for drill pipe. Okay. Storage capacity for any really cutting with the main system. Best. EV system while the driller is running the pipe into the well. The casing has been made up and racked on the port off side of the drill floor, ready to be run in stands of three joints, saving makeup time when it is to be run into the well. So let's see, it takes some time. Take one to make a dramatic entrance. So maybe let's just take a picture of that. You can make a simplified drawing, but then you have to somehow relate it to how it looks like in real life, okay? So that's the purpose of just to make it some more realistic. Um, okay, that's a storage, drilling pipe storage. So that's drilling, and also you need to store, you know, the drilling pipe. Do you want to store casing? Do you want to store tubing? Storage. Uh, what else? Drilling, risers, etc. But that's optional, and we're going to see now a bit why, okay? And on the selection process, how do I select it? That's really, you. not all fields have it, okay? Because it takes a lot of space, then it's costly, okay? Pay, place in the platform or in offshore structure is like place in Manhattan, okay? The Trump Tower. It's very expensive, okay? So you don't want to pay for that unless you need it. Then you have lightweight intervention. Lightweight, we have a uh, slick line, okay? Or also called uh, wire line, okay? Where we send this wire into the well to do different operations. We have, we can have also coil tubing. If we have to make some, some uh, procedure inside the well, we don't need that much space, okay? Because we are not lifting big pipes, but we are doing small operation. Very important, that, so this one we almost always have, okay? Processing facilities, we need the separator train, uh, we need the gas processing train, so how does the train the train look like? Okay. So processing train. Okay. Typically we have let's do it for just oil and and liquid. Okay. We have 
a main separator which separates that's the first they call it high pressure separator separator from here takes out the gas and the liquid the liquid remember you have these valves and then go to the second stage then goes sometimes we even have three stages so we need to have one big separator low pressure separator and then we have this sorry medium pressure MP and then we have this low pressure separator Gas is at the top. Okay. And then finally, we end up with the storage at standard conditions of this Q oil. Okay. And the gas, we have a line that is to export the gas. Okay. We have here the gas. But the gas is not so simple. The way I do it, I typically put a cooler, okay, just to take out, so it will condense some more, because this will be completely saturated, okay? This oil that is coming out of there is exactly, if you see these two, they are saturated. So they are exactly, if we look at the phase diagram, okay, let me make it very small here. In the separation, right, I'm exactly, I'm, I'm, let's say, I'm in here, right, for both, P and T, okay? But the oil I'm taking here will be exactly at its bubble point, okay? And the gas, so that's the bubble point line, and that's the critical point, and that's the gas line, and the gas will be exactly at its dew point. Okay, maybe something like that. So any further reduction, if you see here the envelope, any further reduction I make in pressure will make the liquid to vaporize gas. I will make the gas to, to condensate liquid. Okay, any further reduction in pressure and temperature. Therefore, to avoid that, sometimes what we do is we locate the separators at different heights. Okay, such that to flow from one to the other, you don't lose pressure, but actually you gain or maintain the pressure. Okay, for gas, we don't have that advantage. So the way we do it, we use a cooler, okay, so to condensate gas, and then we use a uh, scrubber, okay, where we are taking, separating the small amount of liquid, okay, that was left on that gas, and that liquid, where do I send it? Okay, is now this one, because it had to circulate, was a less pressure than this separator, okay? Therefore, I connect it typically here to the second stage, that liquid. The gas continues, goes to a compressor, okay? And then the compressor, I connect it to this line. And I have to do the same for every stage, cooling the gas. Then I have the scrubber with a little bit of liquid, a lot of gas. Then I take out this and then I put it here. Here I forgot the valve. Here also I forgot the valve. Okay. And this goes to a compressor, okay? And typically, what I do is that I send it to this compressor here, okay? Remember, the pressure here will be less than the pressure there, okay? And I have to compress to the same pressure, the same PD, okay? So here, the difference between this and that is very small, 
okay, or it's relatively small, so it's easier to compress. If I try to go straight from this up to that, it will be a big jump, and then I will need a very big compressor and more expensive. Therefore, I decide to bridge just that difference such that, you know, it, it will be less. And then here I have exactly the same. Gas. Okay, so remember, you have to be able to make that sketch. I wake you up in the middle of the night, and you have to be able to make that sketch. Separation, facilities for oil and gas, and you have to be able to make that sketch. Okay, then you have another compressor, okay, and that compressor we send here. Okay, and the liquid we just can either here we do one thing usually, we take a pump and we send it back here. Okay, sometimes. So that it, this is what we call a scrubber, and it's like a separator, but for very low amounts of liquid. Okay, and this is a cooler. And after that, we have a few other things. We have the dehydrator, okay? That where we want to drain out the Q water of the gas, okay, the amount of gas. And after that, I have, I might have a few other things, but that's the main process I have on the platform. So you see a collection of separators of different size, compressors, uh, coolers, and scrubbers. Let me see, I think I have, let me see here. Okay, that's the whole picture. What do we have? Okay, typically on the platform. So maybe I can copy this diagram, paste it for you here. Okay, we can have a lot of things, okay? That, the one that I painted, is just this square here. Then you have oil, different treatments, dehydration, dissolving, stabilizing. Then water, we are going to see how you separate water very briefly. And then you have to treat that water, remove the small content of oil, and then either dump to sea or re-inject. Gas dehydration, gas compression, and yeah, that occurs usually, that's not, that doesn't happen in the platform but that happens in the inland, okay? That typically happens inland, on land. Okay, uh, yeah, for water, we make the separator, we sometimes use water separation. Okay, I think I painted this diagram before, but you have a separator that actually has a wedge here uh, which a way a wear and then you have water is going to be accumulated here then you have oil that is going to spill up okay and then you have a gas at the top okay this course is not about processing but I think it's important that you see what kind of elements Q oil Q water and Q gas. Yeah. So that's a three phase, three phase separator. Yeah. What kind of elements you have? And the size, but I was going to open that. Okay, you see okay, how it looks like. Simply separator, a big vessel with some things inside to enhance separation. Okay. Let me copy that for you here. Okay, you have a bunch of other things, but at the end you have, here you have this wear, wear, and then you have, uh, yeah, the drainage should be someplace here at the bottom, and then you have the outlet. Okay, um, so let's go. What else do we have there? We have gas injection system, okay, that I already showed before. Gas compression unit. These compressors are big and they need 
water injection, you need living quarters, Okay, you need the heli deck so that the helicopter can go and transport people. Power generation, this is typically done with gas turbines. Okay. Flare system, the flare if I need to, for some reason, I have an uncontrolled event or I have to maybe do some maintenance, I have to empty my system, I sometimes what I do is I just burn it, okay, the flare. Let me see, I think I have a picture of a flare. How does it look like? Okay, it's here, the flare, you see it, it's sticking out of the of your structure. You have it here also, okay, maybe let's take that picture, it's nicer. Okay, that's the flare. This guy here. The flare, okay, which I use to burn oil and, and gas. If I have some issue, if I'm drilling and I have some problem, I use the flare. Or if I'm doing some maintenance or something in my process that I still have hydrocarbon and it's not safe, I send it to the flare. Okay, what else do we have? We have uh, utilities, okay? Hydraulic power fluid, that means to open and close the valves, okay? Compressed air uh, for operating other things. Drinking water, if we're going to have people on the platform, we need to have drinking water. Air conditioned, okay? To heat or to warm or to cool. I guess here in Tanzania is to keep people, you know, uh, cool. Ventilation and heating system. Then you need a bay for wellhead and Christmas tree. That's also optional. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay. I think I have, let me see if I have a figure of that, how it looks like. I think I have one. was in Gulfax, I think. Um, Yeah, here that's okay. That's the figure I was looking for. Okay, that's a well bay. You see, you have all the well heads, they are on that bay. That's what we call a well head bay. Okay, I have on the platform and I can operate just by hand if I need to close the wing valve, if I need to close the master valve, by some emergency I can do it. So that's the wheelhead, wheelhead bay, okay, or wheel bay, it's called wheel bay. What else do we have? Uh, production manifolds. Okay, we need oil storage facilities for oil offloading. We need to, to, if we are going to load it in a tanker, 
the tanker cannot come very close to the facility, but we have to have some other point. Usually you have like a buoy that... Um, okay, if you have your platform. Okay, and you want to send comes a tanker that wants to load oil. Okay, I don't know how to make the tanker, something like that. Okay, you typically, you put a, a buoy, okay, something like that, and then you put simply a pipe from there to here. So the, the, the tanker is loading from the buoy, but it's not connected directly to the, to the platform. So that's offloading facilities. Offloading facilities. Uh, we're reaching the end. Finally, control system, monitoring system, system for storage, injection, and recovery of production chemicals. Okay, we're injecting a bunch of these guys. Hydrate inhibitor, scale inhibitor, wax, we have emulsion inhibitor, we have a biocide, we have all kinds of things. Here we should have emulsion inhibitor, we have biocide. And finally, we have a small repair workshop, okay? So you have to cram all of these things in that, in that, uh, okay? Now, let's make some types, okay? Now this is what goes on that, okay? But let's make now some types to try to classify this, um, this one I can close. I think here I have it, this is at the end. Okay, and I can make the following like diagram or the following chart trying to classify these structures. Okay, how in, in terms of how they they are built and how they kind of operate. Can you see well from there? Yeah. Okay, so we have two main categories. One of them is bottom supported. That means that they are relying on the contact with the soil, okay? And we have fixed that they are not supposed to move or have very little movement, okay? Which are jacket, that's the, just a steel platform, so also called like that, or gravity-based structure, GBS, okay? And you have compliant tower, that these towers are like this jacket, Okay, but they are very, very long. Okay, therefore, they are allowed to rotate slightly with the base, with respect to the base. Okay, you have now also some other that are floating. Okay, and in floating, you have some that are just simply flowing, moving with the sea level. Okay, where you have SPSO, you have semi submersible, you have this SPSO that we will see now why you need this shape or why they came up with this shape. You need uh, spar, you also have spar, but you also have positively buoyant. We're going to see now what that means, but it's basically another type of platform called tension leg platform. Okay? Let's make just a few comments about fixed, okay? Okay, about fixed, fixed structure. Fixed structure. Uh, and here we have, I think this one we can close. I don't know what that is, that's all. Okay, that's how it looks like, the transport of this platform, of this uh, jacket. Okay, and then we put it on the seabed, but it's not enough, okay? That, that structure doesn't have enough weight to be held by itself. So the way you do it in this, you see that you have some uh, part there. You put like a nail, okay? It's like a big 
a big uh, structure and you start to bank on it okay to be able to 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 stick it into the ground and then you bank it bank it bank it until you reach some formation that is strong enough that gives you enough support for your structure okay and you have to do the same for all legs okay so in that case the, the stability of the structure is given by those piles, okay? These are called piles that are, that are buried into the, into the surface and they have to reach a formation which is stable enough such that it's not going to, it's not going to, to move, okay? Gravity-based structures, they work on a different way. That's how a gravity-based structure looks like. And they are typically, Norway has quite a few of them because it was a big thing for the concrete industry to boost the concrete industry. Okay, and there are a few things that are useful with this structure. That's made just out of concrete, okay? And they are just sitting there by their own weight. It's so heavy that it's just sitting there by its own weight. And these that you have here, these are storage tanks. Okay, that I have to, to store yeah, uh, oil, to store oil, to store water, so forth. These operate on a slightly different principle. When I want to put them in place, they operate with the principle of suction anchor. Okay? Suction anchor, very roughly speaking, okay, you have your you have a geometry that is like that. It's like a cavity, it's like a cave, okay? And you have your seabed, and here I don't have brown. So let's use this color. Okay? You have your seabed, that's what they call the mud line, okay, or that the seabed. Okay, and inside you typically you have some some fluid, okay? Might be water, might be some some fluid. Okay. What you do is that you have a port here and you have a pump. Okay? So you start to suck the fluid from inside and what will happen is that it will it will drive down into the soil. Okay? It will start to 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 drive down into the soil. Okay? When you remove that you create a suction force so, so strong that you, it's going to reduce and go down and it's going to bite down or it's going to be uh, piling down in on the ground. Okay? So here you have by its own weight but still needs some, some, uh... Now, in these two, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about that later. Um, now comes this compliant tower. I don't think I have too much to say here. Okay, this tower. The only thing you see, the the jacket was more on the base, was more was wider. Okay, this compliant tower keeps very much the same cross section all the way. Okay, and here something that is missing on this drawing is uh, the tension. It has some cables. Okay, some tensioning cables, okay, that keep it in place, okay. and that is missing in this figure, just to avoid that there won't be too much rod movement on the, on the top, okay, now FPSO, and with FPSO we have a big challenge, okay, FPSO is simply a ship, remember FPSO, floating, production, storage, and offloading, Okay, what does it stand for? It looks like that. Okay, and the one thing with the with the FPSO is that it has a high, good storage. Okay, it has a, a high storage. FPSOs are typically around three million barrels of storage. So they are not only to produce, but they can also store quite a lot of the oil. Now, one challenge with the FPSO is that 
if you see it from the top, okay, we have the chip. Okay, so if everything goes fine, if the waves and if the wind is going on that direction, right? Everything goes fine because it's exactly a line and it has is passing through the side. But what happens if the wind is starting to come or the waves are st starting to come from the side? That can cause a problem, right? Can cause the ship to tilt and to maybe eventually to to just to just to flee. So what they do what they do is that they have to have all the time to be changing direction, okay, according to where the waves are coming from. Okay, so if they are coming from here, they have to orient themselves on that. But if they come like that, they have to change. Now that's very tricky because the pipes, remember, we have pipes connected to that vessel. When you see it from the bottom, okay, you have a pipe and that pipe is coming up. If you rotate, you're going to break the pipe, okay, if you rotate too much. So they create in the center of the sheet. Okay, if that's going to be a big problem. They create in the center of the ship something called a swivel, okay? Just some part that it will always remain static. And the rest of the ship is going to rotate around it, okay? Such that the pipe can go into that swivel, okay? It's called swivel, okay? And, and the rest of the ship can simply rotate, okay? To allow for if you have waves, significant waves on the side, okay? So that's one challenge with FPSO, you have to always be careful where is the waves, what's the direction of the waves. Now, there is another FPSO concept called Sevan, okay, which is, I don't know where is the company from, I think maybe Norwegian, but they came with the idea that say, hey, why to have the rest of the ship? The ship. Why don't we make it just the swivel? We have to rotate just because it's not the same from every direction. But if we make it round, we just extract the swivel and keep it by itself, then we take away that problem. The FPSO doesn't have to be rotating. Okay, so that's how they came to be this concept. Okay? Just basically, they extracted the swivel, they make it bigger, and they say, that's my, my FPSO. Okay. Um, then you have... Um, then you have, what other things did we have? I think you have uh, semi-submersible. Okay, we cover already these two. Semi-submersible and spar. Okay, remember these are floating by itself. Okay, so it's moving with the, with, it has significant movement with, uh, with the sea level. Uh, that's a semi-sub, no, that's a TLP. That's a semi sub, okay. Semi submersible. And that's typically the shape. These type of ships are used very much for drilling, okay? For sub so for they are used. For, uh, for drilling, okay, for drilling subsea, okay. but sometimes they can be used for production also as well. Uh, then we have uh, the SPAR, okay, the SPAR I think it stands for something, I don't remember now, but the SPAR basically looks like something like that. And we're going to see now how do we select or what is the difference between them, 
okay? But the spar basically you have the pipes going is simply similar to the concept of Sevan, okay? But you know you have uh, you know the lines. Uh, one thing here, you see this, um, you see that the 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 uh, if you see from the top, okay, you see that it has these um, strange uh, like spirals around the around the pipe. Why does any of you knows why why does it have it? No, we have. Have you heard about uh, von Karman vortexes? Let me see if I have maybe this one. No. See, I think I have a nice animation made actually by one of our uh, PhD researchers. Uh, Gilberto. Okay, you see how, I'm not sure if you see it from there, but you see that's on a different thing, that's on a compressor, okay? But you see that you have some fluctuation here at the tail. I'm not sure if you see it fluctuates a bit. Well, in a, in a if you have fluid coming from the side here, okay, you will have a similar process. You will have that actually the fluid cannot follow exactly that shape and coming like that, okay? It cannot do it. Because it's just simply too, it, it, it will have to take, it's like taking your driving or you're taking a curve at a very high speed. You cannot, okay? So it's going to separate the fluid. It's actually going to separate earlier, okay? It's, it's not going to separate. And here you will have some areas where you're going to have a lot of recirculation, okay? But the thing is that that recirculation will change, will start to move, okay, will start to be transient, like just like the video we saw. And that caused vibration on the, on the, on the spar, okay, that will cause vibration on the spar. So they create that such to avoid that vibration, okay, to avoid that it will, it will move. So it's a vortex breaker, vortex breaker. All of these structures, the SPAR, the uh, SEVAN, the SEMISUB, and the FPSO, they are typically, they are held in place, okay, they use also the engines, okay, but they are held in place by either these that are simply hanging, okay, are just chains, are just catenary lines, okay, that they are fixed to the seabed someplace, okay, so they are fixed in place, they have some movement, but they cannot drift much, okay? When they start to go to one side, you start to get tension on that. When you start to go on another side, you start to get tension. Also, they could have some other lines that are a bit tensioned, okay? That are called taut lines that keep them in place. Or they have some, some tension. Okay. Now, the main difference with the, the positively buoyant structure, positively buoyant structure, okay, which is the only one we have is the tension leg platform. Is that they are actually synced, okay? They are not floating freely, but they are actually synced, okay? That means, if you see that that platform is like a box, okay? And I have the sea level here someplace. You are actually, with these tensioning cables, you are pulling it down, okay? So, if these cables were not in place, 
okay? It will simply go up, it will float up, okay? But it's being pulled down by this cable. The idea is that if there comes a wave in this direction and it's going to move it, it's going to shift, let's say, on this direction, you have a wave that is impacting that, you will have a force, a resulting force like that, right? That force has two components, one component like that, one component like this, okay? So due to this force, it will tend to move the TLP back in place, depending where your wave is coming from. So that's the intention of having the, the, the tension leg platform. You have always this are intention. Okay, that looks like that. You have some other design, looks like that, okay? But uh, basically, it looks like that. Okay, foundation that has to be very hard because it has to, they call it tethers, okay? Tendon or tethers. It has to have some elasticity. And you have this type also that is very common in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so you should at least remember the type of, uh, of vessels I have, okay? We have. So we have bottom supported, typically these three. This one is the most common. This one is very much used in Norway and in Canada. And this one and we will see now why this one is used. Uh, compliant tower, there are a few, not many in the world, in the Gulf of Mexico. FPSO, very common, very popular. Many developments in Africa are using FPSO. Um, Semi-submersible, not so common. Sevan FPSO, somewhat, they don't, are, don't have many. SPAR is also very popular in the Gulf of Mexico especially, and TLP, also there are a few in the Gulf of Mexico, in Norway, different places. Okay, so let's go now to see what is the principle behind, or how do we select, how do we select, select offshore structures. Okay, and we're going to see to a few points that are important, okay? So, some points are water depth, okay? Not all of them are, especially those that are supported at the bottom, okay? They are not suitable for, for big water depth. Then we have location of the Christmas tree, Okay, where is my Christmas tree going to be? We're going to talk about that very soon. Oil storage, need for oil storage. And the fourth point, which is very important, are the marine loads. Okay. Of course, you have other things like the preference. Some companies, they have worked with certain type for a long time, so they prefer one type over the other. But uh, these are the main technical, so technical reasons. Let's call it here technical reasons. So let's go to the first one, which is very, very simple. And I want to bring here another, this, this class, we're going to have a lot of images, okay? Which is, uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Can you see? Maybe I can make it bigger. Okay, you see here the water depth. Okay, we have from zero to three kilometers of the water water the water sheet height. Okay, and you see that the jacket and gravity based structure they go from zero all the way to 413. Okay, so if you are in that water depth, 
you probably can use a jacket or a gravity-based structure. Okay? Then a compliant tower allows you to expand that number, that upper limit, 400, is slightly more, goes to 630 meters, okay, compliant tower. Now, floating, floating structures, they can actually cover the whole, the whole thing, more or less, okay, FPSO can cover the whole range, okay, then TLP, usually, because you need to fix it on the ground, cannot go very deep, okay? But they have been used at 1,500. Semi-submersible, just like FPSO, they can cover a wider range. And SPAR also cover quite, quite uh, wide, okay? So a big difference, bottom supported structures, they are for low uh, water depth, for small water depths, typically below 600. And these ones are for kind of bigger water depth, okay? So simple as that. Okay, so water depth uh, less than 600. We use um, uh, bottom supported structures. Okay, if we are talking about more than 600, then it's a floating structure. Okay. Now, the location of the Christmas tree. That's also something very important. I can have two types of Christmas trees. Let's put a, a number, maybe, and we can refer to the number later. Okay, um, number two, uh, location of Christmas tree. I can have it basically in two places, okay? I can have under the sea, okay? Or I can have it above the sea level. Okay? So, what defines... Um, there are a few parameters that define why, you know, where do I want to have my Christmas, my Christmas tree. One of them is reservoir spread. Okay. For example, if I have my reservoir is very compact, okay, everything is located in the same, more or less in the same place. Okay. I can simply put a platform on top okay and I can drill my wells from there and I'm able to drill and produce okay and I'm able to like to drill from the same place the deviation is not very big the wells are not very long and it's technically possible to produce to produce that so in that case, I, I can do I can do like I can do like that. Okay. If on the other hand the reservoir is very spread, okay. Then if I try to make it with only one structure, okay, then the wells that I need are extremely, extremely, extremely long, exactly to reach that that part, okay, and then it becomes non non, uh, you know, maybe it's too long that I cannot reel it, or maybe it's too long that I need a very big Remember, we need to have here a drilling tower, okay? And if I need to make a very long well, the drilling tower has to take a lot of weight, okay? It has to be very heavy and very big. So if I need a very big equipment to make that drilling, then, you know, it becomes non-attractive. Non um, 
there is one more criteria. So that's one thing, reservoir spread. If I have that case, maybe it's better, okay, instead of having one platform, of having, okay, just having the wells and making it like that, okay, so to have wells that are just on the seabed, okay, and, and I can just spread them much, much better, okay. Or I might even have, I might even have a pocket someplace, okay, that I want to develop, and that will make it possible to to do it. Okay. Let me make make the C someplace, right? And you see here, and use an FPSO. Other consideration that we have to take into account to define if we want the Christmas trees under or above the sea, the sea level, okay, is um, is um, Got it. It's um, well intervention needs. Okay. If I need to be very often uh, to be changing, retrieving tubing, changing the completion. So if I need uh, completion tubing replacement. Okay. Tubing replacement. Okay, I need to change the completion, modifications. If I need to be, if I have for some reason, I have artificial lift. Okay, some things that I have to change. For example, if I have a pump, okay, an electric submersible pump, the lifetime of these pumps are typically between six months and two years. Okay. Well, if I have a well simply with no pump, okay, we can have, with no pump, simply can have an intervention of five years plus, okay? So in one case, I might have to do intervention every five years. In the other, I have to do every six months. So I have to go inside the well, retrieve the tubing, and that's extremely costly. In this case, I have to come with a ship, okay, and I have to make with this tower, okay? And I have to make intervention on that well. That's extremely expensive. In this case, I just can do it right away from the tower. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, cheaper, okay? So usually, if I need frequent intervention, the conclusion is if frequent intervention is needed, Okay, then I use dry uh, Christmas trees. Okay, if frequent intervention is not needed, then I use wet Christmas trees. Okay, another reason that why, how to select one or the other, is if I have planned in-field drilling. Okay. In-field drilling means that initially I had, let's say, three wells planned, okay? But depending on how, how the production comes up, if it's very favorable, it means that I have more volumes than what they originally think. I can come later and drill more wells, okay? To do that on a platform with dry Christmas trees, that means that I have to have space. If you see, just remember the picture I showed you before, that typically is very cramped, okay? I don't have much space because real estate on the platform is expensive.
okay? So therefore, if I want to drill, let's say, four more wells here, it will be extremely, it will be impossible, okay? I don't have space to drill those wells here. So in that case, if sometimes I need infill drilling, okay, let me go back to that conclusion. Infill drilling, if yes, okay, then subsea wells, okay, might be more suitable. Okay, and why is that? Because I'm not restricted by space, okay? So do you have limited space in the platform? Okay, so let's sum up. We have location of the Christmas tree, I can have two ways, to have it above the sea level or subsea. How do I decide it? One thing is, a, of course, is the water depth. We forgot to put it here. Let me see if I have space here, yes. Let me add it here, and that's very important. One thing, the first one is actually the water depth. So that because only um, I think I have only bottom supported structures. Structures, TLPs and sparse allow for dry Christmas trees. Okay? Only those structures allow for dry Christmas trees. Okay? So FPSL doesn't allow it. If you are more than, you know, you see, remember the plot we showed later, okay? If you are, the spar is until 2.3 kilometers depth. If you are more than that, you cannot have dry Christmas trees, okay? Actually, the limit is someplace here, 1,500. Let me put that here. The current limit, limit is 1,500, around 1,500 meters. If I have a water depth more than that, I have to use, uh, you know, subsea trees. One thing is the reservoir spread. If the reservoir is very concentrated, I can drill from that same place, okay, with no issues. Otherwise, if it's very spread, it's better to have, instead of having one platform for each location, I just put subsea wells. Okay. Well intervention needs how much I have to go inside the well and make changes. Okay? If, for example, I have to make often tubing replacements. Maybe it's very corrosive. Maybe it's very abrasive, the, 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 the flow, the fluid that I have. So I need it better to use that, okay? Because I can go and change, do intervention very easily. Or if I have a pump, for example, then I have to have this, uh, I have to have this system. If not, then I can just use subsea, okay? And another thing is future expansion of the field. If um, yeah, if I need to make infield drilling later, remember in the in platforms gravity based structure we don't have much spare space. So let's say I find wow great I have a big reservoir, but then I will need to drill eight more wells, ten more wells for a platform. I I don't have that much space. Okay, so that was the number two. How do I select platforms? Okay, it's reason number two. Where was it? Location of Christmas tree. Okay, now let's go to oil storage. And with that, after that, we take a break. Okay, we need a break. Oil storage. Do you need oil storage? And it can be because of many different things, but you have 
remote remoteness okay how remote you are from the market how long it takes for the tanker to go there maybe some weather conditions okay maybe on that particular part where you have your field you have a lot of storms okay so the sea can be agitated and you can you know the tanker cannot come to retrieve your oil you don't want to be stopping production because of that you're going to be losing money okay i have one more thing remoteness weather condition for some reason that you suspect that might be an, um, then you need storage yes okay so the only structures that you can have storage are structures with storage are GBS gravity based structure because they still they store it on the feed okay you remember these tanks that we have here okay they have these storage tanks or FPSO or FPSO okay sparse they have a little bit but not much okay sparse they have something around I think it's like 150,000 barrels which is not much okay so they have a little bit so the two ones if you need to have you know you're going to have problems with the weather problem with the remoteness that the tanker won't be able to come and get your oil you don't have to stop production but you just have to have storage okay where to put it in the meantime yes now to go to the fourth reason and that with that will be uh, the end of the lecture okay we before that we take a break okay but marine loads are a very big reason why you choose you choose structures okay but let's take a break first let's say again 15 minutes and then we cover the last part okay so we come back it's 12 20 21 let's come back uh, 35 okay or 36 12 36 which is the marine loads okay and the offshore structures are subjected to three main marine loads okay one of them so if we put a offshore structure let's make a generic let's make it like a block okay Okay, that's my offshore structure, and let's put the seabed, I mean the sea level, and let's put also the seabed someplace here. Okay, we have three main loads that we have to take care of. One of them is the wind. Okay, the wind. <coughs> the other one is the current okay that i have below the surface the current and the last one is the waves and that's the most important that's the waves and the one that we're going to look closer to okay so typically we have to design our offshore structure that's our offshore structure such that it will withstand these loads okay that i have the wind the waves and the current okay typically wind okay i use a fixed value so a fixed value is used for the design Okay, however, the variation, where is it coming from, is important. So, it's, it's important.
to look at the uh, so where the orientation okay the orientation okay if we look at I think I have one wind map they make this type of maps okay that's that this type of maps okay that you have the platform in the center or the FPSO whatever structure you have and you have typically one location where you have some preferred winds okay in this case it comes mainly from the southwest or the west and then you have different you have a lot of winds that are low speed kilometers per hour okay but you have a few of them that are quite high okay quite high speed but not so much at the variation just the the magnitude and the orientation okay then we have way uh, currents and in currents it's important to see also a constant value is used typically is used okay but here is important for some structures to see at the variation with depth okay if you have a platform for example then it will be important to see the variation with depth Okay, and we're not going to look too much into those, okay? We're going to look at the most critical, which is the waves, okay? Waves, okay? That's usually the most critical because it has two things, okay? It has changes in magnitude, it has changes in orientation, but it also has changes, it has the time effect, okay? A wave, if you see, let's try to make a simple wave, okay as a way if I look at the point with time okay I have okay if I make a very simple wave I have two things okay one of them is called if I put this one is zero is um, elevation okay and I'm going to use this strange letter elevation okay said so the elevation is the distance between the mean sea level. This zero is the mean sea level. And the level of the wave, okay? Depending on where I am. Now there is another parameter that is called the wave height. That is the distance between, this is H, a consecutive peak and valley, okay? Distance okay? So Okay, so typically when you register a wave, okay, when you see a wave, how it changes with, with time, you will see it's not so pretty like that one. But you will see if you are plotting the elevation versus time, okay, you will see that it's actually a very erratic behavior, okay? Yeah, maybe it doesn't cross over, each, over itself, okay? But it's very erratic. Okay, going up and down, up and down. Okay, so you cannot recognize from there just a very clear, like a very nice wave, okay? So what we do in that case, we need to have, like, to be able to correlate it to something like this. And we are going to see very soon why, okay? But we want to see if we can correlate to something to a nicer wave, to something that looks like that. 
So there was a guy, a scientist, a mathematician actually, called Fourier, okay, a French guy. Uh, maybe you have heard the name before, okay? A French mathematician. Okay, that he came with a very powerful conclusion, okay? He said, if you have a signal, okay, that is very irregular, okay, something like that, okay, versus time, a function of time, he said, well, doesn't matter what kind of signal you have. This signal can be expressed as a sum of different signals, okay, F1, that will be like this, maybe, versus time. F2 plus F2, that will be maybe like this, regular. Okay. Plus maybe one like that, okay? Plus infinite. He said you can use as many as you need to represent the original shape, to represent the original signal. Sometimes you need uh, only a, f a few, sometimes you need more. Okay? But he said this is time and this is plus, okay? Maybe, maybe change the colors. Okay? So he, he basically theorize that if we have ft, that will be equal to a sum of some amplitude, okay? Here each one of them has an amplitude, a1, times the sine of wi, each one of them will have some frequency, okay, or some period, t minus, that's not so important, some shift, okay? But he said from i equal to 1 to, initially Fourier said infinite. Okay, you, you saw a lot of them, a lot of signals, infinite. You're going to get your signal, your original signal. Doesn't matter if it's a straight line, doesn't matter if it's any, any function. You can do it with, with his theorem. Okay? Now the practical application we have for waves, okay, that's very important because we get our signal is also very weird, okay? Our elevation with time is also very strange, okay? So we want to find out, and we're going to see now why so soon, okay? We want to find out how is the signal distributed? What kind of components make up the signal? For that, we're going to use a, a concept called FFT, Fast Fourier Transform. Okay. And this fire fast Fourier Transform, what it provides is, is providing these frequencies WI, okay? All of the frequencies that we have here, that basically the frequency is the inverse of the period. You know what is the period here? The period is the time that is ti, okay? The time for an, a regular event to repeat, okay? And the frequency will simply be one over ti. That's the frequency, okay? So it's going to give you a chart, and here it's going to have not the amplitude, okay? Not the amplitude, but it's going to give me something else called the spectral energy. But it's something that is proportional to amplitude, okay? So let's call spectral energy. Okay. And it's going to show you, first, for example, you have very low peaks of these frequencies, but then you have a very strong peak, okay? And almost no peaks at all. That means that the signal, it can be a combination of multiple components, okay? Multiple multiple uh, waves, okay? Multiple signs. But it has one that is dominant. It, there is one that is the strongest, and the signal is made up mainly of that component. 
And we are going to see now why that is important. Okay? So, how do we gather this information? Okay, so you come, uh, so wave elevation data. is typically gathered with uh, voice, okay? And you can do it different ways. You can put it on an existing platform, for example, okay? And you can simply put, if you have the C level here, you can put a boy, okay? That will go up and down Okay, and then it will record the wave elevation data. You can do it with ships, okay? So you have sometimes ships, tankers, that they go in one area and they have the boy hanging behind. Okay, and that boy is recording the, the movement of the wave, all kind of, all kind of things. But you have these measurements available, okay? So now the next exercise, and the last we're going to have, is if you open wave data analysis okay you see with time you see these two columns okay we have measured for a period of this is a bit less than an hour okay like 40 minutes I have measured 4,000 points, that means one point every half a second, okay? This boy was recording every half a second, and that's the elevation, okay? Point 0.8, one, one, almost one meter above the sea level, uh, minus 0.5, minus 0.8, 6, so forth. Okay, so if we, I'm going to do it, you don't have to do it. So I just want to plot it just to show you how it looks like. Okay. Looks something a bit strange, okay? And not very not very understandable. So that's wave elevation. And this is time. Okay. And let's see, let's cut this all the way to. Okay, just to have, here that's just to have, uh, just to see how it looks like, okay? So we cannot see really any trend here. Even if we zoom in, if we make a plot just for 500. Okay, you see that it's very irregular. You cannot detect very much, much period. Okay, much uh, a wave which is regular. Okay, that's just an extract just to show you how it works, how it looks like, and we're going to take that and put it here. So Excel is very powerful. In Excel, we can do this analysis. We can. Uh, just click copy, paste. Okay, we can make this FFT to see exactly how it looks like. Okay, to see which which frequency is most dominant in this wave. And we're going to see now why that is important. Okay, so for doing that, uh, you have to... You have a few things you have to make. That's the frequency, okay? That's the magnitude of the FFT. So that's the frequency and that's the spectral energy, okay? These two. Um, so let's follow. To do that, we have to do exactly very carefully the steps that, you know, it was in this document that I sent you by Kling Klingenberg. Okay, so let's open that and we follow exactly the procedure to calculate FFT. Okay, they say 
label columns okay that's what we have time data FFT frequency FFT magnitude and FFT complex <clears throat> okay You have the sampling frequency, I have already calculated for you, it's two samples per second. Okay. Okay, so it says, take, we're going now to fill this column, okay, FFT complex. So he said, go to tools. Um, I think tools, data tools, okay, tools, data, uh, it's not here, data analysis, it should be, let's see here, data, do you see it someplace? This? This data, no. Data analysis. Do you find it in your, your Excel? No? I cannot find it either, so... Okay, so let's go and see that add-ins, options, okay? Then I go to add-ins. And then we have to select analysis uh, analysis toolbox, okay? That's in origin. Okay, so once more, file, options. Um, then I go to add-ins. And then I go here to go, and then I go analysis uh, tools, analysis tools. Okay. So now if you click on data, you should have it there, data analysis. Okay. So what Larry says, we have to click data analysis, Fourier analysis, okay? So let's go and do that. Data analysis, going to take some time. Fourier analysis. Okay? Then we're going to select, for that data, we're going to select the elevation, okay? all the elevation column. Okay, we have to select also the output range. Where are we going to put that? Okay, so we're going to put it exactly, oi, that's the input, sorry. The input should be this one, elevation. I have to select the output. The output will be from here up to here. I have to go up. Okay, I want to output it here, okay, in that column. And just be careful, you can check that one of them is column B from 7 to 4,102, and the other is E from 7 to 4,102. 4, no? You didn't get it? Uh, 
You get similar numbers? Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so we have our wave, okay, which is these two, elevation with time, measured by a boy, okay, going up and down, up and down. We said we want to calculate exactly what we were discussing before. What are the components of that wave? What is the most important part that carries energy? Okay, for that, Excel is very powerful. We can do it in Excel. Uh, we go to this document. And if you don't, if it was more confusing how I explained, just go to this document and read it through, okay? The Larry, he's explaining it very step by step, okay? But he says here, the first step, let me see, just wait, okay? The first step is to calculate the FFT. And you don't need the time for that, you just need the elevation, because they are equally spaced, okay, in time. So he said that's the step three, okay, that you have to use this data, data analysis to do the Fourier transform, and now you should have these values, okay, which are complex. Now one more step, step four, is you have to say here, this will be equal to two times IMABS, this function, that gives me the absolute value of an in, the magnitude of an imaginary number. Okay? And then I take that number to the left, close parenthesis, and then I have to divide by this number 4096. Okay? And then I block it, this 4096. And that's exactly what Larry is saying here in the in the document. Two divided by the number of samples, we have a different number, okay? Times E maps. Imaginary, the absolute number value of an imaginary number. Okay? Enter. And then we drag it down. Okay. And now the last step. Okay, the next step now, I have to put zero on this cell, but the next cell is going to be this value blocked, divided by this value blocked. I put everything in parentheses and then I sum the previous. Okay, I think that's what Larry says. You have to, the sampling frequency divided by SA plus the previous. Okay.
Okay, so that's what I found. If you go to similar the chart Yeah. 
Okay, so we, we found this chart, okay? And now you know how to do it in Excel. But you make an FFT of that function, this one, and it gives you this chart, okay? So it tells you that most of the energy of the signal, you see you have almost no high components, okay, than here or below here. Most of the signal is made out of, you know, this range here. So this doesn't give you energy, but gives you right away the wave elevation, okay? So this means that you have one signal here that is around maybe 1.5 meters times the sine of, what is the frequency here? The frequency is uh, 0.1, okay? Sine of, no, 0.8, sorry. 0.8 divided by uh, 2 pi times t, okay? So that means that the most, like the most, the, the wave that has the most energy, waves of 1.5 meters elevation and with a frequency of 0.8, okay? Now let's say point zero eight. That's correct. That's very correct. Zero point zero eight. Okay. Now that one is the one that we are going to call the peak spectral frequency. Okay is the frequency at which I have the highest energy, okay? And why is that important, okay? So, <clears throat> let's, let's see here something, okay? Offshore structures, move in different ways, okay? Okay. For example, if you look at a platform, if we have a platform like that, that one doesn't move up and down, okay, in the vertical direction, but it moves like if you were looking at a bar, okay, at a bar that is anchored to the floor and it's going to move in this direction. So you have vibration, it's like vibrating like a bar. So that's the movement, if we call that X, okay, it's going to move x with t okay you have other for example if we see at the fpso once more okay the fpso let me make a better figure or i have it let me just let's try to make it 
okay the FPSO can move up or down right can move in this set direction up and down it can move to the side okay what will be that direction X okay it can move on that direction also can move on Y and on top of that so it can move like that can move like that can move like that and like that okay and can also move like this yes so you have some rotation like this and it can move like this okay it can move like that or it can move like that okay if you see from the top it's rotating like that and you have similar thing for all the different um, for all the different structures now the movement is going to come given by the frequency of the wave at which you excite the structure okay all structures they have what is called a natural frequency okay that you can measure for example this platform of a certain height certain properties it has a natural frequency it's a property of the structure called a natural frequency if the wave that is impacting the platform has a similar frequency okay than that natural frequency the oscillations are going to be extremely big okay and they are going to cause a lot of stresses and it's eventually going to break down okay so that is if the wave frequency is close to the natural frequency of the structure then the the what you say the movement the displacement the movement will be maximum okay then the movement will be maximum then stresses will also be maximum okay and there is a high risk of failure So that's why we are so concerned about knowing the dominant period, the dominant frequency of the wave, okay? Because if it's going to be the same as the structure, we are in trouble, okay? We are going to be in big, big trouble. So just to show you a plot I have, that I think came from Statoil, Equinor, okay? For some things, you see the natural frequency of the structure. Let me show you here okay so you see jacobs and jackets that's the, depending on the water depth how long they are okay you see that there the period is the inverse of the frequency okay the period is 1 over W okay so if you are within that range okay your the jacob is going to have problem maximum oscillation okay you see here the tlp you see the spar they are up here the semi submersible the heave is the the movement the vertical movement what we explained here before this movement in set that's what we call the heave so if uh, if us uh, if um yeah semi submersible i use a period of 10 20 maybe 25 okay seconds is going to have significant oscillations and it's going to have problems okay and here on the left you see the period of some some phenomena okay you see earthquake affects very much the jack the, the jacket okay uh, vortex shedding that's where I told you this uh, you know the shedding is this um, what I explained before with the spar okay this board this is called vortex shedding okay also has a period uh, let's look at wind okay wind is here up here so it's going to affect very much semi submersible sway sway is this movement okay of the ship when it's moving on the lateral side and where do we have waves waves are here okay in this range 
okay? And here you have some other wave uh, up here. So that's why it's extremely important to find out what is the dominant period of the wave, the dominant frequency of the wave. So the way this is done, okay, is going to change with time. It's not that you're always going to have the peak spe spectral period. So what you people make is that they make measurements. They assume first one assumption, okay? So one assumption to gather wave data. Okay? The assumption is the C doesn't change much in a period of three hours, okay? That's what I call a C state is a period, a period of time when the uh, spectral period, a spectral period doesn't change much. Okay? They say in three, it's a period of time, typically three hours, okay? It's a period of, it's typically three hours, where it doesn't change much, okay? So then they do measurements every three hours for a long period of time, okay? And for each one of these, so let's go here, period, okay? They go one, two, three, four, five, okay? Period of time. Each one of them has a duration of three hours. They record the TP or the peak spectral period. Okay, in our case, what did we have? We had um, a 0 0.08. What is the period? What is the period? One over 0 0.08. That's how much? Twelve point five seconds. Okay, that's our period. Okay, so for all of them, for all of these, I have to have hundreds. Okay, many, many of them. I have to have data for a long time. So I have here, for example, that will be twelve. Then that will be maybe nine. That will be maybe two. I have different periods. Okay, and for all of them, I also calculate a par parameter called significant wave height. Okay, that day, if you remember, the, the, the height of the wave was the difference between one consecutive valley and top. Okay, and I also record that number for that. After I have this, this, um, this data, okay, for a long, for many, many periods, for, they say I have to gather it for, you know, uh, how many years, I think I have it written someplace. They have to be gathered for a long period of time. I perform, the second step is to perform a frequency analysis. Or, well, not frequency analysis. I can just plot the data right away. Okay? So let me show how the data looks like. Okay, very interesting. That's for a platform in the North, in the North Sea, for a, a SPAR. Okay? So you see here you have at the top, the spectral peak period, okay? Remember, we have 12, so we are someplace here in between, okay? And here you have the significant wave height that you have also from record. So you see here you go from big waves, 17 to 18, all the way to small waves, 0 to 1. And you plot all of them, and you count from all the data you have how many times this combination occurs between this height and that period, okay? How many occurrences, how many of these combinations do you got? Okay? The color code is showing the ones in red, the ones that have happened not very often or never. Okay? They have zero. They never happen. So you never had a wave very big with a very small period or a wave very big with a very big period. Okay? And it shows you which one of them happened the most at that region. Okay, so you see that region has waves of two to three meters, okay, 
and from 8 to 9 seconds. Okay? Waves of 2 to 3 meters that come every 8 to 9 seconds. So that's, that's how you characterize the sea. Okay? And if the structure you're going to use is has a natural frequency that falls there, you're in trouble. Okay? So that's why if your natural frequency is someplace there, you should use another structure. Okay? So that's a way to visualize, let's put here, so that's to visualize uh, is a C state data, okay? Okay, the number you, you record it for many, many, okay, many points, sometimes you need more than 100,000, 200,000, something like that, okay, a number of points. And you collect that, remember, that's from measurements. You remember with, you collect it with a boy, okay? A measuring sheep, you need a platform, you collect it someplace, somehow. After that, you take all of them and you collect how many times this combination happened, how many times that, and then you make this color plot, very useful. That means that your C here, that's the most frequent. This combination happens the most. Okay? So I have, the bottom line is, I have to select uh, an offshore structure which natural period is not, okay, the most frequent uh, spectral, spectral peak period in this chart. If my structure has a period, for example, happening here, you say, well, that happens very, very little, okay? I will have problems very, very little, um, or maybe here, okay? That's fine. But if my structure, the natural frequency is someplace here, I'm in trouble. It will be most of the time subjected to those kind of, uh, to those kind of loops. Okay, so now we are finished with all, I had to, had to even finish a bit early. But Golan told me you're having exam very soon, okay, of natural gas. So he said he wanted to make sure that you, um, that you understand some basic concepts. He gave, sent me some, um, so let's call it here Golan refreshment, okay? <laughs> Michael Golan refreshment or a refreshment of concepts okay so he told me that I should be sure that you understand the molecular weight of a pure component I think is for the for the exam that's we told was what he told me okay what is the molecular weight of a pure component? For example, if I say water, right? H2O, what is the molecular weight of water? I have two hydrogens, right? Each hydrogen is two, is one, plus oxygen is 16. I get that the molecular weight is 18, right? And that the units are kilogram per kilomole. Okay, or gram per mole. Okay. Now, what is the mole fraction? I have here an exercise he sent me, okay, 
that you have total number of moles okay I have this is for air okay I have air with that composition okay that's an exercise okay so you have air that has 18 gram mole of O2 that's nitrogen uh, that has air nitrogen that has 78 gram of mole simply mole okay not gram mole just simply mole of N2 and 4 moles of CO2 okay so what is the the mole fraction of each one of them the mole fraction what is the mole fraction typically we use x of o2 the number of moles of o2 18 right divided by the total okay so the total is 18 plus 78 plus 4 and i think that's 100 that gives you 0 0.80 okay the same thing with the others x n2 um 0 0.78 x co2 is 0 0.04 okay simply the number of moles that i have of oxygen divided by the total now the other thing he told me to check with you was molecular weight of a mixture how do i calculate the molecular weight of this mixture okay remember here we have a molecular weight for each one of them how much is it for oxygen 32 right for this molecule o2 the molecular weight is 32 right for n2 how much is that 28 yes the chemical engineers they have to help me okay i haven't seen these things for a long time co2 48 okay so the question is what is the molecular weight of air okay molecular weight of air is the molecular weight of O2 times the mole fraction of O2, yes? Plus the molecular weight of N2 times X of N2 plus the molecular weight of CO2 times X of CO2. That means how much? That now to make some calculation, that's uh, 32 times 0 0.18, that's uh, uh, 28 times 0 0.78, and that is uh, 32, you told me, 48, okay, 48 times 0 0.04. Twenty nine point five two. Okay, that's because we have CO two. In general, we use in petroleum molecular weight of air is twenty eight point ninety seven. Okay, in petroleum. Okay, and why is that number important? Because for gases in petroleum, we define something called the specific gravity of the gas, right? And what is the specific gravity of the gas? Okay, is the molecular weight of my gas divided by the molecular weight of air. Okay, that means if I have this number, let's say I have 0.8, okay? If this is 0.8, how much is the molecular weight of my gas? 
simply it will be 0.8 times 28.97 okay and how much is that Twenty-three point one seven six. What is the molecular weight of methane? It's uh, C plus four H. How much is that? Sixteen. Chemical engineer, help me. Sixteen. Okay. Molecular weight of ethane, how much is it? We have two C's, we have H, 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 and H, H, H. How much is that? 24, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 30. Huh? 20 or 30? 30, okay? So that means if I have a molecular weight of 23, I don't have pure methane, but probably I have some heavy components that make it even a little bit, that make it, you know, uh, heavier. Now the last thing he told me, and then with that, conversions between moles, mole fraction, and mass fraction. Okay? So how do we calculate the mass fraction? We have here, how do we calculate the mole fraction, okay? So how do we calculate the mass fraction? Okay, mass fraction. <clears throat> the mass fraction, right? Let's make it with which letter do you use for mass fraction? Let's call it maybe Y, okay? Mass fraction Y. How do you calculate the mass fraction in our example of oxygen? Is the mass of oxygen, right, divided by the total mass? What is the mass of, of oxygen? Is the number of moles of oxygen, right, times the molecular weight of the oxygen, yes? Then divided by the number of moles of total multiplied molecular weight of the mixture, okay, of air. Yes? Okay, that's mass Okay, that's how much mass I have, because remember, molecular weight is kilogram per kilomole, okay, or it can be also made as gram per mole, okay, and this guy is in mole, okay, therefore they go cancel each other and you obtain gram. And here the same thing happens, okay, so that's how much, that is, for our case, is so actually let's do something before IO2 mass fraction is equal to the mole fraction O2 right this is here is the mole fraction divided by or times molecular weight of O2 divided by the molecular weight of air, of the mixture, okay? Is that correct? Chemical engineers? Yeah? We are not inventing new chemistry here, right? I'm not... Okay, so that's the mole fraction. So for our case, how much do we have? Let's say we have here 100 moles, right? 100 moles of air. Uh, then we had uh, the molecular weight was 28, 29 point, 
three, you said fifty two. Then up here we had the molecular weight of, of oxygen that's 32 times the number of moles of oxygen that was 18. How much do we get here? I'm getting 0.195. Let's see if we got the same that, yes, 0.196, yeah, 5, 1, something, okay? Okay, so I'm not sure why, but I would suggest you to at least do a, a recap, but Golan told me that you should, you should um, review those topics. I think the exercise, one of the exams will have some question on that, okay? of this of these concepts okay so we have reached the end of the lectures on field development like i mentioned there are a few other things that we don't have time to cover that i cover in my regular course but you got the core the most important okay outside of these topics everything is like important but secondary you can live without it, okay however if you're curious i told you you can go to to my website, okay, someplace I put it here, or to my YouTube channel, and you can there see many lectures I have done the last years with some of these topics, okay? But you got the core, you got the most important. Um, I, I don't want to go through all the topics, but maybe we can go through this, uh, what I have here, okay? The, on Monday, we saw life cycle of an oil and gas field, we talked briefly about the field development process, and we went straight to the technical part, production scheduling. Okay, we want to find out how much we produce from the field. Modes of reservoir outtake, relationship between plateau length and height, onshore versus offshore, oil versus gas. How do we estimate plateau height? Use a simple calculation. Flow equilibrium. That's the main tool that allows us to calculate the, prof the profile. Okay, when is the plateau going to end and how is the profile going to look like post plateau? Yeah, then we talked about, uh, we did an example for block two here in Tanzania. How do you calculate the plateau? For that, we needed to use material balance uh, then we went into NPV. Most of the decisions in field development are based on economy, okay? If the project is profitable or not. So we went into net present value calculations that uses this discount flow method, discount cash flow method. Then we went very briefly into flow assurance, okay? How flow assurance is important, something we have to take into account when designing our field. Uh, then we went to what happens if the system is not identical, you have different wells, how do we solve with networks? That networks is very useful for other things. Then we went to probabilistic reserve estimation, Monte Carlo. Okay, And then today we talked about trees, when Monte Carlo is too expensive to run. The field development process, we cover it in detail. And finally, offshore structures for oil and gas production okay so that's the end of the course i just want before you go if we can take a photo okay just to show my wife i was not having fun in arusha okay <laughs> otherwise she don't believe okay so i just have to say here they are, these were my students okay before you go but uh, so i really uh yeah enjoy teaching you i hope you know you get the video and then if you have any question, you watch the video and you try to, to kind of get it in, in your head. And I'm going to upload the notes. Uh, I think, yeah, it was, I put it here. Okay, that course. I'm going to upload the notes, the videos, everything is here. Okay. 
And I just want to say to congratulate you, you know, we have, it was very intensive, you know, five hours, really no break, everything trying to, but you manage, most of you, like I will say 90% managed to do the exercise, okay, to follow it in class. So I think that's very good. You should feel good about yourselves. And we have done almost like two exercises per day, okay, very, very challenging. Okay, with that we close.